Well, Russ, I have to say I'm a little disappointed that uh, Greek week is over. I was enjoying all that uh, tzatziki and feta cheese that went with my uh, listening. It was uh, very enjoyable. And all that great uh, Greek jazz that we heard, too. It was a really good week. Uh, yeah. I like Greek food a lot. And I like Greek jazz now that uh, we've got uh, turned on to some really good players. We really got into it. It was good. Yeah. So if you haven't checked out last week's episode, uh, check that out. All Greek to me. And also check out our bonus episode, uh, Interview 4, with Jacobo Simonidis, uh, guitarist of the Yako Organ Trio. Yeah, and listen to that record, too. It's really great. And I'm sorry Greek week's over, but I, I have a feeling that we're going to be uh, coming back to Greek things a lot with this new uh, kind of jazz movement there. With jazz, yeah. I don't know about classical music. I'm going to have to keep my eyes out for more things. They do come out, though. Right. Uh, I've, there's Every once in a while, there's something. So, uh, And uh, you can count on the Nexos label to you know, release something, mm. you know, in, in that category. They really, they're really adventurous. I really appreciate them yeah. for that. Well, we do have, I'd like to, we, I know we have a lot of American listeners. I think they're our number one uh, audience. We have, you know, people listening all over the world, but most of them are in America. And I'd like to, right. uh, being Americans ourselves, I'd like to wish the United States a happy birthday. Tomorrow is July 4th. That's uh, the USA's birthday. So uh, happy yeah. birthday, America. I'm afraid we don't have any uh, American classical music this week. It just didn't time out that way. But I've got something next week, so uh, okay. tune in next week. You'll have a late, uh, you know, America's birthday bash with one of America's uh, most famous composers. Great. I'll tell you about that later. We always have American <laughs> jazz, America's gift to yeah. the world. One of them uh, on a right. podcast, so we'll have some of that here. And uh, you know, one of the many. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say. This week, uh, summer really hit us uh, hard. <laughs> oh, it did. Yeah, we were uh, up to, uh, what, 38 degrees the past two days? It got up to 38 degrees uh, Celsius. centigrade. Yeah, that's like yeah, 98 Celsius, degrees right? Fahrenheit. Uh, yeah. Things were cooking. Uh, <laughs> it was hot, but it, yeah. the, the thing is, where we live, it's uh, often very uh, humid as well. And it wasn't humid this week, no. thankfully, because that, that would have been back today. <laughs> unbearable. The humidity came back today yeah. with the rain. It's raining today. But it is a little cooler. Yeah, we've got yeah. a typhoon coming through this week, which will... Well, it's not, so far, it's not a typhoon. It looks like it's a tropical storm, which I'm looking at. It's kind of a wimpy time, which is good. Usually what happens... See, we've got work this week, too. So this pretty much means, like, a, I ride my bicycle to work, you know, because I'm, a, you know, want to just keep active and things like that. Otherwise, I'd just sit, be sitting on a sofa all day listening <laughs> to music if I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And we teach, which also means that you're on your feet, even though you're not really doing anything. You're not sitting in a chair generally, you yeah. know. And uh, but it looks like it's going to be a really wet, uh, you know, <laughs> week at work. This I get, I, I really hate that because I have to bring a change of clothes because I usually go on my bicycle even on the in the rain, and uh, you, know, you can't really just go in, into the school dripping wet. So I have to duck yeah. into a you know Become a, like a restroom, and change my something. clothes. You're all soaked. Yeah. It's water world. Sponge Mike. Yeah, that's me. Well, anyway, <laughs> wet or dry, the hot weather is hmm. here. And, you know, there's nothing um, musically that really gives you a chill, a cool yeah. down, like some nice uh, mallet work on the uh, vibes or marimba. Uh, so we've got a special program this evening of uh, some really chilling, chilled out vibes and uh, marimba for you, both in classical and in jazz. So you've got that to look forward to. We do have a classical uh, marimba album yeah. this week, but uh, before that, we're going to get into some other stuff. I've got another odd theme going in classical music. Um, it, well, let's let's start it off and I'll let you know what it is. Oh. Um, the first... You're... Yeah, before we get no, into all oh, that... you got to tell us the name of the podcast, yeah. don't you? And we who are we? Are... You are I listening to Adult Music <laughs> Podcast with Music for the Mature Mind. And this yeah. is, in fact, episode 70, 70, yeah. um, plus four interview episodes. Uh, put those out in a special category, uh, our latest last week. And uh, before we get going into our usual programming, which uh, almost always includes six recordings, three classical, three jazz, for everything we'll discuss 
You can uh, get the links in the episode description if you want to check out the recordings uh, before or after on Spotify and Apple Music. Uh, also, at the top of the description, you'll find a link to the full episode playlist. Uh, you can get all the music in one place on our preferred streaming platform, Deezer. It comes from France there, and you can also follow the podcast there. Uh, you can get the links to the uh, playlist and the podcast all in one spot. Uh, just look us up, Adult Music Podcast. Now, if you don't see the full description of the links uh, and uh, other material on whatever app or platform you listen to us on, because we're on pretty much everything, uh, you can always come over to our host site, Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com, and everything's uh, easy to follow and find there. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, uh, we'd appreciate it if you follow us or subscribe on whatever platform or app uh, you listen to us on. If you take a moment, give us a ranking or a review. That helps us get listed in the browsing category recommendations. Helps us grow our audience, which we appreciate a lot. You can also find us on Facebook. Uh, leave a message or comment there. And uh, boy, we've been posting a lot of uh, new things you on Facebook this week. too. Yeah. yeah, whenever I find something yeah. that might make it on the podcast, a new recording, uh, almost every day. I'll put it up. I've got a lot of really cool organ stuff this week, right. uh, so I feel an organ episode uh, coming up soon. But you can check. I us put out. up promos, yeah, for my yeah. Uh, three uh, recordings this week. I got to keep doing that. It's just I, you know, we we're in the end of the uh, school semester now, and yeah. I just get really distracted. I got to really get get that Facebook stuff going on. We need we need a website. I got to start getting somebody to design us a website. Yeah, we'll see. The know. next I'll thing we'll work on. Around. But anyway, yeah. in the time being, uh, you can look us up on yeah. Facebook. And you can also put any comments or questions there. Or if you want to contact us uh, directly, uh, if you're a record label or artist listener, uh, we do get uh, something. We got a nice one today from South Africa that we're going to look into. You can contact us on Gmail. That's Adult Music Podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Uh, we'll be sure to reply to you. Any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. I have to say, just doing this podcast for 70 episodes is uh, really, I feel like uh, my mind has matured, like a fine wine. I've gotten a lot of uh, this process, you know. Um, it's organized <laughs> my listening. Uh, yeah, me just, too. just what to listen to and uh, yeah. made me really sort through all that's available every day coming out on streaming. So I have a process of not like uh, noticing yeah. and then vetting and listing up things that I want to listen to. And then of course, being able to, you know, put those things into words. That's the hardest part. Uh, talking about music mm. uh, can be quite difficult, but it's been a fun exercise. Yeah, it has. It's kind yeah. of, yeah, it's, and it goes on it gets more fun as it goes. You know, I think anyway, yeah, I'm really rather enjoying following all this stuff. All right, so uh, the first album we have, we're really going back to the uh, the Renaissance era. I really like Renaissance Baroque music in general. You know, it's kind of a yeah, very, it's a very different world than what we live in, and especially like Baroque instrumental music, it's just really cheerful. But anyway, we're in uh, the Renaissance uh, today. This is with uh, the composer uh, Thomas Lupo. This is an album called Fantasia. Um, some people might say Fantasia. I'm going to go for the Italian here, Fantasia. Uh, and this is by a rather well-known uh, ensemble called Fretwork, and uh, it's on the Signum Classics label. All right, now Fretwork, um, they are a, a consort of viols. A viol is sort of like a an early cello, I guess you could call it, mm. but uh, it's not quite as bright or um, sort of nimble or throaty as a cello. It kind of... It's, it sounds a little different, but basically it's held the same way. Actually, no, I don't know about that. I don't know if they hold it between their legs. I think it might be. Um, there, there's, there's a video sizes, I put up. Right? Yeah. yeah, there are different yeah. sizes of them too. So some of them could be like violas or things like that. Mm -hmm. But they're not held under your chin. They kind of stand yeah. them on the chair and play them like a cello, I think. Anyway, you can see the video on uh, Facebook. I've put that up of one of the yeah. – uh, they, they've actually put up um, – video of um the recording session for just about all of these works so i just put one of them up but you can mm. follow that link and go back to youtube and see them all if you're really interested in this anyway fretwork is celebrating their 35th anniversary this year Ooh. they've been around for a That's long a time yeah. and i've heard quite a few of their uh recordings over the years um on this album they have six players and they are emily ashton richard boothby william hunt joanna levine Asako Morikawa, Sam Stadlin. And uh, 
Richard Boothby and William Hunt are the only two original members. Actually, Richard Boothby is the only original member. Hunt is back as the sixth player just on this album, I think. Um, mm. I think he's kind of not always in the group anymore because they've reduced their um, uh, their membership, I guess, to five people. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a picture... He's listed as an ensemble member in the lineup. He's not separated mm. from the rest of the ensemble, but there's a photo of the group, and, and uh, he's not in the photo. Uh, mm. There are only five people in that, and uh, they're all wearing uh, pandemic face masks with uh, fret and work written on them. Oh. Very cute little marker of the time. And this is on the Signum label, right? In uh, Which I believe is based in London. They're definitely British. Mm. I'm pretty sure they're based in London. And they do a lot of um, um, British artists, let's say, if not... Um, composers. Anyway, Thomas Lupo will be counted as a British composer. His family, this is pretty interesting, his family comes from uh, Venice. They were, um, they're a Jewish family. They're in Venice and their name wasn't Lupo, I guess, or apparently it was in uh, Hebrew or whatever language they were speaking then. And um, they came, they became known in Italy as um, the Da Milano family because they would just kind of call you by your first name in those days and then uh, tack on where you were from. It was pretty simple. You still have hmm. names like this today in Italy. But uh, the funny thing is is that you can have someone whose name is Damilano and they're from somewhere else you know, because people <laughs> move around because they don't stick in the same place anymore. Anyway, um, so Thomas, he's from a – they're a musical family and they were sort of imported into England by Henry VIII um, who uh, wanted more music in his court because he was uh, looking for a new wife. <laughs> boy, <laughs> boy, boy the, uh, what it must have been like in that court, I don't know. But anyway, um, Thomas Lupo, uh, he, he's um, one of the, uh, I think the grandchild or the great-grandchild of the first uh, Lupos who came over. And uh, I should mention that the um, cover art on this album consists of, uh, it's the eye of a furred animal. And I'm mm. guessing it's probably a wolf because um, lupo in Italian means wolf. Right. And they might be referencing that with the cover art. Ah, those clever cover artists, I tell you. Anyway. But um, he was um, employed by um, – Thomas Lupo was employed by um, Henry VIII's daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen who was uh, – who really was uh, responsible for um, – a lot of arts kind of had, came out of that. She had a lot of uh, music written to her as well as other things. And uh, he was also in uh, Prince Henry, uh, that's James, I think James the I's um, son who came after Elizabeth. I, I don't know. I was <laughs> just reading it. The, I didn't really go through all this. Um, he was in his, um, he was working for Prince Henry of Wales. Okay, back uh, in uh, the 1600s and playing also in Queen Elizabeth's court, his viol. Okay. All right, so anyway, this is a um, a recording of 20 uh, fantasias, actually 19 fantasias and one pavan, pavan being a Spanish-type dance, a slow kind of sultry dance, I guess. Um, and it's, it's for this, um, the uh, number of players in each track um, changes. It's from anywhere from three to six right. viols of different sizes. So if you've never heard a viol ensemble before, they have a very... Um, distinct and really unchanging timbre. They they don't play with um. There's no vibrato, so it could sound really um. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Sort of um somber, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, these don't quite sound like that. There there a lot of them are a little more lively than you usually here. The uh, fretwork ensemble here uses a pretty light touch on these, which is a little bit of a surprise to my ears. I mean, I don't. I haven't been listening lately, and uh, certainly styles change. Even um, performance styles change, even in modern day for old music. So it never really sounds the same as it did ten years ago, when new um, artists get their hands on it. So the timbre of these uh, works, it, it might seem kind of bland, but um, there is in fact a lot of variety in the pieces themselves. So this, mm -hmm. I was a little surprised. I thought I was going to have to break up this album into a few listenings because they're all, you know sort of the same type of work but it turned out that I actually listened to the entire thing straight through all 20 tracks and was pretty entertained by it you know but it's not a, it's not exciting music but it was very interesting I liked mm. it enough 
Okay, so we start out with um, all these works are called Fantasia, and uh, Fantasia one in five parts, and then there's a number after it, VDGS eleven. <laughs> Not gonna go through all those, but Fantasia one in five parts, and uh, the first thing I noticed from this is brought me right back to my uh, ear training days. Perfect fifth, dun, dun. it just starts up with this le- that perfect fifth leap, and I was like, I was back in my ear training class when I heard that. <laughs> I never got very good at this, but uh, I wish I were. I'd hear it so much better. But I remembered that one. And we take off from uh, there. There's a lot of counterpoint, and this is the Renaissance era. As we know, the Baroque really brought fugue and counterpoint to its height. But there's loads of it in church music and in this, this more secular um, entertainment music for the court as well. Um, the tone that these instruments make are pretty thin, which is um, a positive thing. Usually you get this big, thick, fat tone out of these instruments, and they just kind of sound really lugubrious. But that's not the case here. Um, the intertwining musical lines get uh, transparency from this. We can hear them pretty clearly, and it's a really good recording as well. Um, so that helps also. There's a rhythmic vibrancy and liveliness to this quickly played music that draws one in. Um, it's not just intellectual music. Um, it's 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 got a lot of uh, it's got a good feel to it. This particular work is pretty lively. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, everything registers really well in this one. No vibrato, of course. And uh, the real pleasure in this is sorting out the individual lines and how they interact. Fantasia 15 is the second track. This one's in three parts. And the opening of this one sounds almost Bach-like. You can think of your um, your Bach fugues and how they start. It, it's Now, this is before Bach, of course, and they don't... Of course, this isn't a fugue. It's, a fantasia would indicate that it's up to the um, composer's fantasy to decide how it's going to go. So it doesn't... The piece doesn't have a set structure. And in fact, all of these are different. Some of them are in ternary form. Some are binary. Um, and some of them are just sort of a set of variations. It's uh, pretty interesting. There's a lot of variety here. And it will keep the ear engaged. Um the second, this this uh, Fantasy of 15 is lively, dancey, and really charming. Lots of rhythmic vibrancy on this one, and it's very short at uh, just over two minutes, two minutes and one second. Um, there are only three parts. You could hear all the lines very clearly. Third track, Fantasy of 29 in five parts. Um, I should mention, there's a long pause between each of these Fantasias. Um, so there's a lot of time to just kind of collect yourself and get ready for the next one. <laughs> Uh, this one starts on the lower um, instruments, and it has a darker tone to it, but still, rhythmic vibrancy is present. There's not as much movement in the lines on this one as there were in the first two. Melodies are more conjunct, which means they don't leap to like um, higher sort of uh, registers very um, nimbly. They just kind of go from you know note to note, like, and the notes tend to be connected, uh, and they tend to run up scales in this work. Um, the whole sound of the ensemble is beautiful throughout this and the previous two tracks as well. Um, there's an admirable val- balance between the voices and lines. There's 35 uh, years of experience for you right there. Fourth track, Fantasia 8. Six parts. Wow. But uh, this one starts very simply. The voices build up as the piece goes on. And this one is sadder and more somber than the uh, first ones. Um, I'm enjoying the sober lines and the bass in this one, in Fantasy 8, track 4. Keep an anchor-like hold on the harmony. We go on to Fantasy 15, track 5. This one starts also in the lower range with some low harmonies, and it's somber like the previous um, Fantasy. Uh, halfway through, though, the rhythm livens up a bit with a more edged melody starting up. The melody has a bit of an edge to it. A nice surprise to perk up one's ears halfway through. And then the droning basses come back for the end. So this has been a ternary form work, I, I guess. And they sound lovely and sandpapery through the speakers. I really <laughs> like that sound. That's a little roughness to them on this one. Fantasia 13, track 6. This one's shortish, 2 minutes 50 seconds. Starts in the higher register this time. So um, these have been a, like this program has been arranged so that our ear is going to hear something different at the beginning of each work, which is really nice. It was, it's really good programming. Uh, maybe that's why I was able to listen to it all the way through. There are only three voices, and uh, so it stays really high. Um, highly transparent texture and a pretty somber piece. It sounds very earnest, and there's kind of an inconclusive ending to this one. It doesn't end on a tonic chord. 
seventh track, Fantasia 31, in five parts. Um, short phrases start this one up, giving the melodic line a shape that's easy to follow through the five parts. You hear a lot of attack on the strings because of that, because the theme is constantly starting up again. It's very short, um, it's e and it's easy to hear through the ensemble to those, so good five-part writing here. This one's a little on the livelier side. And then at uh, a minute and 15 seconds in, there's a sudden change to a livelier rhythm. And then 30 seconds after that, we get a more conjunct, right? Note to note, to neighboring note, a dro more droning kind of sound. Track eight, Fantasy at Two, in six parts. This one is a highly rhythmic work, and it actually has a bit of a folky feel to it. Now, when I say folky, I don't mean like Bob Dylan and Joan Baez folky. I mean like <laughs> John Dowland folky, you know, from the, <laughs> the Renaissance era, you know, singing to your maiden, that kind of thing, um, you know, on the on the, on your guitar or some sad song or whatever. Um, it's not, I don't think it's, well, I don't want to say, okay, if it's modal or not. Uh, the, the bass instruments are busy as the upper instruments play longer, drawn-out melodies. There's a middle section with a more somber feel beginning at around a minute and 20 seconds. And it features long, drawn-out, vibrato-less melodies. At 2 minutes and 35 seconds, a lighter, textured version of the opening rhythmic material resurfaces, and the lower instruments eventually come in for some ensemble work of their own. The material is passed between the two sections, which is very cool. Kind of nice uh, little ear candy there. Until we have the full six-part texture playing at the end. Track 9. Fantasia 17 in three parts. How exciting are these titles? I just want to <laughs> point that out. These, these were just made to be played. They were probably played once and then like put away in a drawer mm. somewhere. So we just get them. They don't really have titles. It's just something somebody listened to once or something like that. Anyway, Fantasia 17 in three parts. This sounds like a perfect fourth opening this piece. Again, I'm back in my year training class. It just has this one isolated instrument doing that leap. And the rest of the vials follow to a company. It's a pretty lively piece with a fairly cheerful and rather optimistic sound to the melody combined with this rhythm. Some nice imitations between the treble and bass voice at a minute and 20 or so. The blend of the instruments is particularly pleasing here due to the orchestration. And this constantly moving forward theme abruptly moves to a cadence at the end. Track 10. We're halfway through. Fantasy of 30 in five parts starts high up in one of the instruments ranges while the others play counterpoint in the mid range while one eventually moves downward to ground the harmony at 47 seconds there's a sudden change to a lighter texture and shorter phrases one of the phrases eventually spools out into something much longer this was kind of interesting it was really inventive i thought at a minute and 39 seconds we're back to the more mobile rhythm and harmony of the opening then, at 2 minutes and 5 seconds, we get something new, high, and ghostly in the upper registers, and a pause in this constantly moving fantasia, which is kind of a surprise as well. There's a cadence at 2 minutes and 32 seconds, and something more somber and conjunct in the lower registers. It's a lot happening in this one. Track 10, make sure you hear that one. It's pretty, uh, it's like three or four pieces in one, mm. in, uh, it's 3 minutes and 33 seconds. Track 11, Fantasia 9, in five parts. This is a motif with a repeating opening note, opening the piece. That makes it easy to hear in the texture because you hear those notes um, repeating every time the uh, theme enters. Um, it's picked up by the other instruments, and even in the hard-to-pick-out in-between registers, it's pretty easy to hear. At a minute and 25 seconds or so, there's a change in rhythm and character to something slightly more somber. And at 2 minutes and 10 seconds, we get parallel harmonies sounding highly resonant and satisfying in this context. Parallel harmonies are unusual in music of this period, especially in the Baroque. I remember in music theory class, they were not allowed or parallel fifths. You couldn't have that, right? Mm. I don't know why. I guess they said it weakened the sound of the harmony. But I always thought it was a really cool sound. It just wasn't cool for Baroque composers. But it means that the if if you have like a like a C and a G, that's going to move up to a D and an A. They're going to just move this in the same no direction. No power chords allowed on there. No yeah. power chords allowed. We're so used to that's the thing. They sound cool because we grew up listening to rock and roll, and that's all yeah. parallel harmonies. Yeah. If you're playing bar chords and things like yeah. that, yeah. 
Um, uh, the ensemble plays conjunct melodies with long sustained notes to end the piece. Then we get to track 12. Oh, a little surprise. Pavan, 28 in three parts. This is the uh, Where's Waldo of the set. <laughs> He's here on track yeah. 12. Uh, the Pavan is the only piece that is not called the Fantasia on the album. So it uh, references a specific dance from the era. Um, which is an old stately Spanish dance, the Pavan. I'm pretty sure it's Spanish. Anyway, it doesn't sound much different than the Fantasias. It simply takes the slower pace that is expected of a Pavan. Um, it's rather somber in tone, and it continues this way up to about 2 minutes and 45 seconds when there's a sudden and quick melodic move which suddenly dissipates as soon as it appeared, and it comes back at the end of the work, bringing it to a close. Back to the Fantasias. Track 13, Fantasia 10, in five parts. Despite being completely removed from the Pavan, uh, it shares the same catalog number. This is VDGS3. I don't really know why. Maybe they're connected somehow. Hmm. Um, they are similar in approach. Um, this particular one is played at the same tempo as the Pavan and features uh, slow, drawn-out phrases, mostly in the lower end of the ensemble. Uh, five parts give it a thick texture, and two minutes in, the melody suddenly picks up some rhythmic thrust and ticks forward at a more defined pace. It gets even more playful in the upper register at two minutes and 30 seconds in, and keeps this tempo to the end. So it kind of gains energy as it goes. No, you know, Listen for these things, because it makes these sort of, um, you know, these kind of non-varying timbres sound mm. very interesting. There are There is a lot of invention happening in these works. Fantasia 2 in five parts. This is a fugue-like theme, but it's not a fugue, of course. That would be a Baroque-era invention. Uh, opens this in the high register. It's fugue-like in that it just sounds like something that's going to be in a fugue. It kind of has this kind of mm. character that sounds like it's going to be broken up and sort of developed in a lot of ways. Uh, the other instruments come in in imitation, and we can pick out that theme in the five-part counterpoint pretty... Uh, easily I'd say at 40 seconds in the melodic material changes to something slower one thing I love about these works or and really Lupo's writing in general is the sudden new idea taking off after a cadence like you'll hear the resolve and then there's no real pause on that it just goes off into something like completely new mm. like he just can't contain his ideas he just they just kind of keep going out it, it feels like he has it his mind is very active let's say by a minute and 50 seconds, we're into something more active. A cadence follows, then a slower tempo. And I'd guess um, this particular fantasia is uh, variations, but I can't pick out what the variation is on. Maybe the bass line or the melodic material. It's, it's, I can't really say at this point. There's a more lively variation around uh, 2 minutes and 50 seconds, and this brings us to the closing cadence. Track 15, Fantasia 12, in three parts, very short at 2 minutes and 4 seconds, and it starts somberly in the bass with drawn-out notes and pretty much outlines the harmony of the work at this pace. This feels like it's in two sections, like a lot of Bach's sweet movements. The melody blossoms a bit into something more memorable at the end. It's sort of like, it almost sounds like it's kind of um, almost... It doesn't have much shape at the beginning, but it kind of takes on shape by the end. Sort of like almost like a, there's a growing process happening in it. Fantasy eight in three parts is a theme with repeating bass notes, and the other two parts come in imitating it. Uh, this brief fantasy it keeps up with these themes. It's in two parts. Fantasy of thirty five in five parts, and this one has a title. Oh, Kevetzosa, which means Ooh. oh, how charming. By, by the way, my family name, Vezzuto, I've, I've asked many uh, Italians what it means. What it means, they say it doesn't mean anything, it's just a name. Um, but I like to, it's the closest thing I've ever found in Italian to it is this word, Vezzosa. So uh, that means mm -hmm. that it, in English, if, if it were related to this word, and my Italian friends assure me it's not, that would make me Michael Charming in English, mm. which I think is a fantastic name. <laughs> anyway. I'd be biased, so I'd need to get a, you know, a, <laughs> another point of view on how accurate it is. So. If you're all looking for your Prince Charming ladies, here I am. Anyway, That's right. yep. anyway, this work, yeah, you're gonna say something there. Go, go I ahead. I was gonna just say yeah, you know, yeah, 
Send your inquiries to Adult Music Podcast. <laughs> it's the one word at gmail.com. And I'll forward them all right to you. <laughs> yeah, we are, we already we already know a few people who might do that that we really don't want to hear Yeah, you from. have a few charmers on your uh, on your trail, <laughs> on your fantasia. <laughs> yeah, well, their fantasia anyway, apparently. Oh, I don't yeah. know. Anyway, this starts um this piece starts <laughs> with a lilt in the melody. Uh the rhythm necessary to put that across, which is a dotted feel, continues up to around a minute and 30 seconds when the rhythm and the melody smooth out and it continues to the end like this. Fantasia 10, track 18. This one starts with a rather lamenting, turning downward figure in the lower register, which climbs higher with each of the six instrumental entries. Um, the texture suddenly livens up about two minutes in. Um, about two minutes. I didn't really notice the exact time. Mm. And the rhythm becomes more active until about the three-minute mark, where everything slows and smooths to high conjunct level and leads to the ending cadence. I should mention, when I'm listening to these works... I want to hear the flow of the whole thing. So if like I miss like a cadence or, you know, a new section starting, I don't go back and find out where it was. I guess I should do that later, but I just, cause I just want to hear the whole thing and how it goes. I think it's kind of bad for you to stop it, the tape and things like that. This track stuck out to me because there's yeah. a great kind of string fuzz. On oh, the lower viol here that just <laughs> kind of <laughs> I like comes that in myself. and uh, you yeah. get that, you know, real, sound that you're not going to get on a modern string instrument and i really liked how they just you know i don't know if that was planned or not but it, it's there and mm. uh it's a unique texture uh that just stuck right out on there uh right on one of the bass notes uh you'll hear it on here and i liked it a lot all right yeah i like i like things like that as well we, we got a lot a little bit of that on an earlier track as well mm. um i which i mentioned let me just pull it out again if I could find it. Oh, track five. Yeah, at the mm -hmm. end. Okay. So give that a listen to. I, I heard the same effect. All right, we're now on track 19, almost at the end. Fantasy of five in six parts. Uh, this one starts with a harmony between three or four of the instruments, and we're led through a series of chords with occasional ornamental decoration. Uh, cadence is reached a minute and 20 seconds, then a lighter, more melodic texture with a dancing rhythm takes off from that. Another even lighter texture, also with a livelier rhythm, comes in at three minutes and seven seconds and gains in intensity until the final cadence. Really nice work, this one. Um, track 20, the last um, Fantasia, number 27, in five parts, has a slow opening with a conjunct melody. The instruments open in the lower end. There's only one instrument in the higher end. And the melody becomes more active as the piece goes on, and at about 2 minutes and 50 seconds, we've got something clearly defined. The upper voice is thrown into relief by the lower end figures. The piece heads to its final cadence while we're in this mode. All right, well, anyway, this album, first of all, this is it's it just creates a really uh, pleasant atmosphere if you're just going to listen to it um, in you know, in the background, it's fantastic music for the early morning. Puts you in a really mm -hmm. good mood, and it's very gentle, and it's cheerful too, uh, which isn't always the case with this type of uh, mm -hmm. concert of viols music. It's about as cheerful as vibratoless playing can be. Um, I get a sense of sunshine just starting to peek through the blinds as the new day begins, which we're not going to see here tomorrow, but <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we had that all last week. Maybe that's why I thought of this metaphor. It's a good record to put on for ambience, as I said. Play it all the way through. It sets a mood. Otherwise, if you're doing close listening, um, I would suggest breaking it up just so you can get all the detail out of the pieces. Um, they do all sound different, but I think the uh, the, the sameness of the timbre might mm -hmm. uh, get to you after a while. Um, it did get to me, though. I really um, I enjoyed listening to this all the way through, even with my typewriter, just kind of, you know, or my computer here, just um, typing up all my notes on these. Um all the, this this album is prov the works are pro programmed to provide a variety in the rhythm and the tone of each work so it is actually a really enjoyable listen um yeah highly recommended to those who uh are interested in this in this kind of music and um just for something to um relax you as well yeah i like this uh, because i like vials a lot i have an album i put on once in a while um it's by the group uh, phantasm Mm. And uh, it's uh, Purcell. Uh, I think I may have this one myself. Um, yeah. yeah, fantasies, well, English. 
And uh, so, you know, it's a similar kind of um, ensemble idea. I think with uh, Lupo, you, you get uh, a kind of interesting mix of Englishness with a little bit of Italian spirit mixed in there. Yeah, you can sort of hear the uh, that, uh, that Italian sunshine in there. He, yeah. must, that he must have absorbed from the music of Italy when he was in Venice. Right. And so... Or the family did anyway. It puts you in a different kind of mood, you know, with this. You, you do have varied number of... Uh, vials from three up to uh, six here, uh, you know. So the sort of scope of the sound changes, but not the instrumental sort of timbre variety. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could see that as kind of static and boring. Um, on the other hand, if you're in that mood and you get in the zone and you appreciate the the nice timbre of these strings, it allows you to focus on you know what is changing. And here mm -hmm. it's you know. The lines are all heard really clearly on this recording. So you can hear the different approach to the composition, uh, the different directions of the lines and the moods that are created uh, here. Uh, there's a lot of contemplative and somewhat melancholy moods, but there are some bright spots, you know, peeking through with uh, a little bit more uplifting melodies. And yeah. I found it kind of focusing of attention to listen to. I think it's a good one. Brew up a pot of tea uh, <laughs> and sit down and focus on the blend of that, you know, earlier instrument construction, the unique sound. Like I said, there's a few other surprises with some nice fuzz on that string. Um, <laughs> you know, a little bit of roughness, but it's very... At, at, you get the roughness of that instrumentation, but as you say, there's no vibrato. So it's a clear kind of tone for each instrument coming through. Um, I, I enjoyed it. There's enough variety in the compositions to, to pull you through and find something new in each piece to focus on. And yeah, I found it uh, kind of meditative and yeah. uh, I was able to you know, make it through in a single listen, just picking out the differences and you know unique characteristics of each little piece. And they're short too. So yeah. you know, you don't have to focus too hard for a long time. I just want to mention, if you're kind of a, a more intellectual type, the uh, intellectual pleasure in these pieces comes from, as in most polyphonic music, the changing sort of intervals and interaction between the individual voices. So you might want to, yeah. if you want to meditate on this, like, you know, focus on that. It's really, you know, wonderfully kaleidoscopic. All right. And uh, next, the funny, now when I programmed um, tonight's, um, classical works i chose this next album which has something in common with the lupo this is kind of interesting i didn't see this coming this is uh johannes brahms a composer i'm sure that we'll <laughs> we'll all be listening to one day no just kidding the famous johannes brahms this is his uh, piano quintet in um f minor opus 34 and his string quintet number two in g major mm. opus 111 and this is performed by a, a, an ensemble that I like a lot, the Pavel Haas Quartet. They're from the Czech Republic. And they are joined on this album by Boris Giltberg, an Israeli pianist who was born in Russia. And Pavel Nickel, the viola, on, on the, on the uh, second viola on the string quintet. Now, what this has in common with the lupo is that we have in here a former member of the Pavel Haas Quartet coming mm. back in Pavel Nickel. He was one of the uh, founding members of the quartet and uh, here he's an extra viola. He, he left it, I think in, uh, I think I wrote this down somewhere. Let me see. He, he left in 2016 and uh, so I guess he's just back for this recording and this is on the Superphone label, Superphone, uh, which is a Czech label. Now, one thing about um, this label, and really I think East European and even Russian labels in general, is that they go for a more like matte sound, M-A-T-T-E, matte. Like it's not shiny. There's kind of like a, see, I hate using words like deadness because it sounds negative, but what I mean is like it doesn't like, the sound isn't like shiny and bright sort mm -hmm. of. It doesn't sound like it's kind of reverberating. It's just kind of, it's, I, I think, I don't think that's, it's a, question of a good or bad recording i think that's the aesthetic that they're going for it's probably in the mastering you know the kind of overall sheen to the recording is a little bit uh, unique here 
It is. And all Superphone recordings tend to sound like this, too. So there's not a lot of... You're really hearing the the notes that are being played. You're not really hearing the room, you know, or anything mm-hmm. like that you know, on these types of recordings. There's something... Uh, like light doesn't reflect off this sound or something, if you can imagine what I mean by <laughs> yeah. that. When we listen to it, maybe you'll know. Okay, so the first work we get here is um, the Piano Quintet in F minor, Opus 34. This was written in 1864. Brahms is still a pretty young man at this time, so it's an early work. And it's a pretty uh, dramatic one as well. This one has uh, Boris Giltberg on the piano. Okay, and this starts out um, with the Allegro Non Troppo um movement which is pretty long um it's got this smooth legato opening which is nicely textured and then this uh more aggressive uh conclusion to that uh line is played here in a smooth buttery fashion it often sounds really um um aggressive on other recordings but here not so much it's kind of there's something a little bit um sort of smoothed out about it um um, I, I mentioned that um, there isn't a lot of room noise, but I think uh, the acoustic on this recording is a little reverb heavy. I think there was too much, actually, here. So you're not getting the, uh, the sheen of the instruments, but you're also getting a lot of this mm. reverb. So I, don't know, I didn't really think much of this, the, um, the uh, sound of this um, particular movement the you know the recorded sound but uh, it it improves actually after this which i don't know what happened but um i'll get to that when we do this is, so it's just this movement i think maybe your ear adjusts or maybe my ear adjusted anyway the instruments register at the uh, very quiet volumes which is nice and the loud parts are very loud <laughs> the soft parts farewell they don't have much room halo around them which i liked um, Superphone recordings can be hit or miss this way. Um, let's see. This particular um, movement, anyway, sounds a bit too distant and wet for me. But the, and I think the mic is turned way up so that the the because they sound like they're kind of far away, mm. and the ensemble's playing quietly, so the, uh, the the pots are turned up really hot, and then when they get really <laughs> loud. It just kind of pins you to your chair. Um, the performance is highly lyrical, I should say. The artists here are highlighting the melodic aspects over the dramatic, I would say. Um, in in this early work, we already hear the quickly changing moods that would be a hallmark of Brahms's later compositions. For example, the string quintet we're going to hear after this. Um, we get a repeat of the opening material at 3 minutes and 45 seconds. The sound remains harsh, the loudest parts. Uh, nice detail in the bass of the piano, though. Um is picked up in the quieter sections. Um, I like a lot of the uh, quiet pizzicato in the cello at about the sixth minute or the repeated chords in the piano at six minutes and 15 seconds. I like Giltberg's playing in general. I have a few other of albums of him playing. He makes the melodic gestures from the piano stick in the ear, shaping them memorably. At seven minutes and 22 seconds, the development section begins very quietly and mysteriously. Nice detail emerges. The downward cello line after seven minutes and 45 seconds, for example. And again, you hear it at 8.10, eight minutes and 10 seconds. The deliberateness of the softer attack at slowish tempo allows for a bit of tenderness to come out of this movement that I'm not familiar with in this piece. So I thought that was a nice uh, hmm. interpretative um a discovery on my part and really um you know sort of a move on a nice interpreted move on the ensemble's part um pizzicati and the cello register vividly at nine minutes and ten seconds or so we stumble back into the re- recapitulation at 10 minutes and seven seconds or rather just before that with the quiet material again it's nicely shaped we get a heavenly sounding coda at the end quiet then suddenly crescendoing to the familiar loud theme from the beginning and resolving to the tonic chord in a stormy rendering of that. The second movement is Andante, un poco adagio. This would be the slow movement. Uh, Again, we hear vivid pizzicati from the cello. It's a nice sound. Um, He gets all of these in the composition. I think he's the only one who plays any pizzicati. And he's accompanying the gentle piano theme. The rendering of this movement's rhythmic lilt by the quartet is really lovely, and Giltberg is suitably gentle in his playing as well. There's a gentle resolve at 3 minutes and 50 seconds or so, and a shift into a new key and section afterwards. 
I like the lilting characterization that the quartet gives this movement. It's full of character. As a result, the opening material returns rather imperceptibly. And again, lovely shaping of the material all the way through. Um, this movement has a gentleness to it that surpasses other performances. And because it's very quiet, the sound quality is very good here. <laughs> we don't have any ear splitting uh, <laughs> crescentos or fortes here. The third movement. So you want to, if you want to isolate a movement, do that. Check out that one, the hmm. Dante and the Piano Quintet. It's really nice. Third movement is a scherzo, which means joke, by the way. Um, the joke, by the way, is a joke on the old minuet. Okay, it's, so it's not like a traditional minuet. It's like a little sleight of hand. So it's it's usually more rhythmic. And this one has an allegro, and then there's a trio. So it's in ternary form: A, B, and then A again. This one is, uh, this movement is rhythm driven and has a creeping opening theme that switches to some kind of uh, like welcoming fanfare or bridal entry kind of <laughs> reminds me of like, you know, somebody, somebody important just walked into the room. Uh, the opening quieter material is uniquely shaped by the ensemble. It's a highly enjoyable performance. Attacks on the strings are varied throughout, constantly drawing the ear and causing the writing to stand out too. At three minutes and seven seconds, the trio section begins. It's got a rustic feel with its droning bass and country dance-like theme. The bass eventually becomes piano accompaniment. There's a nice uh, transition to that. And the opening theme comes back at four minutes and 20 seconds, and we get a repeat of the opening material. I like the way the ostinato repeating pizzicato cello bass gets a menacing, creeping quality to it in this and the opening of the work of the movement. Sorry. Tension is built up effectively by the ensemble. Uh, Giltberg manages the quartet's building intensity in the coda, and he's a good match for them artistically throughout on the same page. He's on the same page as they are. Fourth movement, finale, has an introduction, poco sostenuto, and then the main section, allegro non troppo. This starts quietly and on dissonant string lines, a little bit like uh, Mozart's uh, dissonance quartet. At a minute 38, Seconds, the faster main theme starts. I like the flexibility of tempo in this. It sounds like it's rushing along. Then when the rhythmic bowed figures in the upper strings disappear, it seems to slow a bit. Louder sections in this movement register more clearly than they did in the first movement. I think some adjustment has been made at this point. The Pavel Haas, once again, excellent at putting a bit of uh, paprika into the Eastern European dance rhythms, as at 4 minutes and 15 seconds and onwards, then maintaining a dance beat from 4 minutes and 30 seconds until the rhythm breaks up at around 4 minutes and 45 seconds. So they, they can change their character, like on a dime, and I really like that about them and this performance, and really all of their albums. I've really been following them rather closely. I like their their uh, approach. Um, these sorts of, you know, real attention to the rhythm and the um, mm. ground the work admirably. At 5 minutes and 26 seconds, we get a bit of a musette melody. A musette is a French uh, bagpipe, which is gentler than the Scottish version. And I really love this section. The ensemble aren't playing notes from a score. They're playing cultural memories embodied in the various quick-changing rhythmic figures. Remember, they are East Europeans. And um, when Brahms was alive, there were a lot of um, Hungarian immigrants in Germany playing their instruments. And... Um, because of the Hungarian Revolution of 1848, I guess. And um, he heard a lot of the, this um, sort of cultural music and it got into his music. And it's really nice when musicians really understand this uh, tradition and can really give it life as the Pavel Haas mm -hmm. Quartet do here and Boris Gilberg. Um, a lot of cultural memories are being exposed in this movement. We usually don't get the various dance and rustic rhythms outlined so precisely as they are here. For me, this is the most fully realized movement of this work by the ensemble, but it's got me wanting to hear the whole work again to make sure I didn't miss anything, which is a good thing. Uh, the ensemble sounds most inspired here. We reach a resolution at 8 minutes and 30 seconds. Then a coda begins. There's eventually a slowing, then a big build to the ending cadence. So this is a good performance, not as dramatic as some, but highly melodic, nicely shaped, and with a soft, focused tone. It's a bit different than what we usually hear, and that's a good thing. It's a reason mm -hmm. why you should hear it. 
Um, fortissimi sound harsh in the first movement, but softer material or registers clearly. And to my ear, at least, the fortissimi clear up by the fourth movement, which is one of the most inspired performances I've heard of it. I also loved the second movement a lot. Um, this is a performance that I think will reward further listening. Either the ear justice goes on, or the sound itself, clear, itself clears up in fortissimi. I think it's a little shame about the recording of the first movement, but I think the uh, performance of that also is very good. All right, so we move on. String Quintet number two in G major, opus 111. This one was written in 1890, the last decade of Brahms' life, so it's a later work. And this one features Pavel Nickel on the second... Um, well, he plays one of the violas. It doesn't really indicate which one. He's the guest violist, and he's also a founding member of the Pavel Haas Quartet, as we mentioned earlier. So here he is back again. Hmm. Um, this one, I sort of am wondering whether the string quintet wasn't maybe recorded first, because they get a good sound on this. They get that matte sound, and string quintet, string ensembles need to be recorded very closely um because any sudden increase in volume isn't going to pin the meters on a uh you know on a recording uh, like a piano will a piano mm -hmm. is one of the most difficult album uh one of the most difficult instruments to capture on tape mm -hmm. because the sound comes from all over it and it can suddenly get very very um loud <laughs> and really uh Hit your meters. I think the most dangerous, not the most dangerous, maybe also the most dangerous, <laughs> the most difficult instrument to record is the soprano voice. <laughs> and you yeah. better get it right or they'll be really it mad. It's dangerous too, yeah. <laughs> for me anyway. Yeah, that's why it's dangerous. Maybe my, my old memories are coming back because <laughs> they, they can pin that meter pretty quickly. Okay, them and the piano are the two. So when you have a soprano accompanied by a piano, you're as an engineer, you're really at your wit's end. Anyway, lots of room ambience uh, on this one that nevertheless doesn't distract from detail. Um, there's a dense romantic sound to the opening, a rushing figure followed by a broad romantic melody. Uh, th this this work, it's the end of the 19th century, and um, Brahms can get very intellectual, but here he's really broadly romantic. This really does mm. sound almost syrupy, this melody. Um, the melody is taken at a fairly quick tempo, yet the generosity and broadness of the themes register. Um, beautiful piano, uh, not a piano instrument, a piano meaning a soft <laughs> section at 2 minutes and 50 seconds, and a rustic sound at 3 minutes and 8 seconds just before the cello starts his theme. Uh, there are lovely changes of attack and overall sounds created by Boeing to constantly draw the ear in. This ensemble is creative in its approach, and not only here, but on other recordings I've heard. I just want to see who the uh, the cellist is on this. This is, uh, I didn't write it down. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Oh, well. Um, Forte has come up sounding relatively warm and clear. Uh, the development in this movement is kaleidoscopic. It's hard to predict where it'll go next. We get back to the recapitulation at 9 minutes and 30 seconds with some variation on the orchestration, as Brahms will do. And there's a brief coda at the end that leads to a big closing cadence, nicely taken by the ensemble. I'm going to look up this uh, cellist. This is uh, hmm. Peter Jarosek. Okay. I was wondering who that was. Okay, second movement, Adagio. This has a quiet, pleading theme, seemingly led by the violas. I'm using my ear for this. If, you're at, if I was at the actual concert, I'd know. Or if I had a score. Or the violins in their lower range, maybe. I think it's violas. We hear the higher range of the violins at a minute and nine seconds. Again, some nice playing with the tone from a minute and 15 seconds to a minute and 20 seconds as the violins play vibrato to lend the passage austerity. We get to some forte, passionate playing at the four-minute mark. Then a pulling back as the viola gets a melody. The opening theme repeats at about four minutes and 45 seconds, and the movement ends quietly. Third movement, Un poco allegretto. The scherzo movement has a ghostly hovering theme, quietly and mysteriously played. There's a big crescendo at 55 seconds or so leading to a decrescendo and quiet cadence at about a minute and 20 seconds, or just before that. 
The material continues afterwards in a new direction. The trio section starts at 2 minutes and 10 seconds and has a clear, circular, pastoral dance quality to it. It's quietly played. The opening section comes back at 3 minutes and 47 seconds or so. Fourth movement, vivace ma non troppo presto. This is the shortest movement, oddly enough. Hmm. Um, they've gotten shorter as they've gone, in fact, in this work. Um, this movement has a quickly changing texture, often underlined by sudden changes in volume. The main theme is a country dance type theme that quickly dissipates into more sophisticated thematic material. Again, the ensemble do a lot of changing of attack to indicate the quickness of character changes in the music, and they kind of keep your ear sort of glued to what's happening. Um, I haven't heard many performances of this uh, string quintet. Um, this is the, the one by, um, who was it? The, uh, oh, I'm not going to remember now. But there was an old Hyperion one that I heard. I can't remember the ensemble, but it was, um, maybe it was the Raphael ensemble, but I can't remember. Um, back in the 90s. But I can say I enjoyed this one. And the uh, Pavel Haas uh, Quartet with Pavel Nikola are excellent guides to the work's mercurial changes in form. And this is a pretty fantastic matte finished recording, too, if you like that sound. Um, this outshines the piano quintet recording, but the um, both interpretations are, have, are full of character. And um, as is always, has always been the case with the recordings of the Pavel Haas Quartet, it really is something you should hear. They always have these uh, interesting um, um, ideas to add to their interpretations, and I'm, I'm always captivated by their... Uh, performances so i would urge you to hear this and uh see for yourself i think you might rediscover these works in certain ways i enjoyed these a lot you know when you got brahms on you're going to have these sort of you know passionate rapid mood changes and lots of dynamic things going on and what you really need i think to pull these off is a sort of overarching map of you know the whole work and the, yeah you know, all the yeah. various changes in dynamics and moods and rhythms and things that are going on uh you know so they can put them all in context so you pull off the whole work really well and i think they do that extremely well um you know they have a sort of vision at each step of the performance and it, it really fits into that overall completion of the work that goes through all these changes and so i was really impressed with you know the interpretation and the sort of sequencing of each step along all of Brahms sort of, you know, sometimes startling <laughs> changes yeah. in uh, material as he goes along. So I, I thought that was really outstanding, uh, very passionate playing uh, yeah. like that. The recording quality, as you say, is a, kind of a mystery, uh, doesn't lack in clarity. So yeah. you can hear each of the parts in the strings, you know, very well. But it's sort of the overall blend that is a little bit uh, unorthodox uh, as far as a mm. string ensemble. And I also found that um, in the piano quintet, the piano gets, in comparison to the strings, sometimes I felt it was swallowed up in the passages when I wanted to hear more of the piano tone. Uh, Although that gets better towards the end as it goes along. It's uh, odd, I huh? Thought, they must yeah, have changed something. something. Why don't they just re-record the first movement? <laughs> yeah, if they, I'm, I'm not if sure. If they changed everything. Yeah. I don't know the, what but they did. That said, the, the, the ending of the first movement was so good, it was a real wow moment of passion. So maybe they yeah. didn't think they could recreate that. I, I don't know. Yeah, um, you don't know. You want to go for yeah. what's best. Yeah. And although it has this kind of matte you know, finish to it, I mm. I found a lot of clarity in the individual string parts, so I could hear them all really well. So it's right. kind of mysterious. I wonder, you know, what they're doing different <laughs> differently there when they record. Yeah. It. It's not bad at all. It's just a unique sound. But rather than focus on the, you know, what the recording sounds like, the the passion of the performances and the overall arc that the they take, I found to be, uh, you know, really satisfying and well done. And uh, although I've heard these uh, before. Uh, it felt like I was hearing them anew, but yet yeah, really know too. that mm. really know that I was listening to Brahms done extremely, you know, satisfyingly well in a performance. Yeah. So I, w I would recommend these to you know any uh, Brahms lover or anyone who likes very passionate, you know, romantic uh, music. Uh, you'll get moved and experience real 
dynamic uh, contrasts and uh, intensity in these performances. Yeah. Yeah. While we're on the topic of the uh, Pavel Haas Quartet and it being uh, um, Independence Day in the United States, I would like to um, uh, encourage mm-hmm. listeners to hear the Pavel Haas Quartet's um, uh, recording of a Dvorak's um, string quartet, I believe number 14, the American Quartet, which oh. uses um, American themes. He wrote it at about the same time as the New World Symphony. Hmm. And uh, the Pavel Haas uh, Quartet's performance of that is fantastic. You really need to hear that. I haven't um, heard that. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Oh, it's good. Check that out. I actually yeah. have that on a CD back there oh. somewhere. Um, that, that'll uh, make your uh, July 4th weekend uh, very satisfying. <laughs> so hmm. make sure... Give that a listen. It's an older record. I think it came out in the 2010s at some point. Mm. Maybe even before that. I'm not even sure. But I, I should probably pull that out myself and listen to it again. Yeah. It is, it's really, really good. And it's a very enjoyable work. If you don't know it, right, you, you'll like it the first time you hear it. It's just got all these fantastic, catchy melodies in it. All right. So on we move to the third of our classical selections for tonight. And this is where we get into our... Um, um, striking bars with a hammer theme yes okay so russ is going to do uh vibraphone on in jazz and um and marimba too and marimba too yeah. okay well here we're going to talk about the marimba which is the vibraphone's um what would you say it's uh acoustic uh wooden cousin of, uh, <laughs> yeah it's wooden the, uh, cousin <laughs> analog uh natural analog uh, relative acoustic, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah all right this is this is it's kind of the one that lives in lives in the country and the the vibraphone lives in the city yeah, the i guess woody right? cousin yeah because it's, it's woodsy and okay mm. whatever okay this is um called ravel influences and it's by an ensemble called trio sr9 <laughs> <Yeah. You're laughs> not the most inspiring yeah. name <laughs> <laughs> who are you going to see tonight oh a trio sr9 i don't know <laughs> it sounds very uh 2020s mm. <laughs> you know Sounds like something, yeah, an ailment, you know, for your for your iPhone or something. <laughs> I got the new SR9. All right, and in, this is on the Evidence Classics label. Got to give them a shout out because uh, it's a, we don't know who they are. Yeah. It's a very small <laughs> First label. For me, yeah, yeah, it's the only album I've ever seen on this label before. Um, Ravel influences now, of course, Maurice Ravel, the great. Uh, French composer who had an incredible ear for orchestration. Um, <laughs> that orchestration is going to be taken away from him on this album because we're <laughs> going to hear mostly his music. We're going to just hear it on marimbas. Now, marimbas can get quite a few sounds, actually. Mm-hmm. They can they can create some pretty astonishing uh, textures. Um, this particular album, even though it has four works by Ravel, has two works one three movement work by Ravel but it's got a mostly a Spanish theme to it there's a lot mm-hmm. of um, Spanishness to this and in fact especially in the first work which is Ravel's um, Rhapsody Espanol from 1907 this is the fourth movement or fourth section of it um, called Feria which means like a a holiday or a feast day or some holiday or something like that and this one features a piano too uh, Shani De Luca playing the piano and on this one, the piano comes in first. We don't hear the marimbas. They're kind of, they're teasing us. <laughs> they want to make their entry. Mm. The piano comes in alone. And then we hear the woody marimbas come in and blend with it beautifully. It's really a nice little uh, good blend here. It's a pretty interesting arrangement of this work. There's a pretty astonishing bass sound yeah. at a minute and 30 seconds <laughs> in. You notice Not that too, out, right? Yeah. It's like, whoa. Yeah. First, I thought we were like arrived in the land of the toys with the beginning yeah. sound and then uh, yeah. when that uh, l- waves of low marimba come in it, it's almost a little unsettling <laughs> yeah that just kind of oozed out of the uh, mm. subwoofer man it just kind of yeah. like went right for the solar plexus wow the rib cage and dental fillings too <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. a nice effect I really liked it I want to hear more of that um and I guess that's the low marimba, yeah. Yep. I've never heard a marimba play that low or make that sound before, so that was pretty exciting for me. You must have, like, big redwoods in there or something, you know, like these huge... <laughs> <laughs> they used a special tree for that bar, right? <laughs> wow. All right, the Spanish feel of this piece is put across very well. We then get a more mellow nighttime Spanish romance theme at about two minutes and four seconds in. 
soft and spacious, full of character. Gorgeous rising and falling, hardly defined legato marimba figures at about 3 minutes and 50 seconds. The dance theme of the opening starts to reemerge in the fourth minute, and it just kind of gradually comes back like we were far away mm-hmm. from it, and now we're approaching it again on our, you know, by walking towards it. We get that wonderful low bass sound again at four minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> There's no way you could have missed it the first time, <laughs> but you get to hear it again. And we're back in the opening material. Great performance, and it left me exultant. Yeah. So, nice opening. All right, next we get um, a piano piece by Ravel for the three marimbas only, and this is uh, Gaspar de la Nuit, which is from uh, 1908. Um, this work is known as one of the most, well, the third movement, which is called Scarbo, is n- known as one of the most difficult uh, works in the piano repertoire. So, um, I mean, they're more difficult works than that, but they're not in the repertoire. That's the point. So it's <laughs> it's the mo- one of the most difficult works a pianist is expected to play to be able to play if you're going to be a professional pianist. Um, okay, but um, here it's um, it's um, played by three marimbas. Um, the, um, okay, so Gaspard de la Nuit is um, a set of um, sort of, it's a book by yeah. Aloysius Bertrand, I think it is. I have it here somewhere. I don't know. Anyway, and they're sort of kind of spooky sort of, um, stories and things like that the first movement is ondine and ondine is a water sprite she sort of inhabits a lake and she uh entices uh, men to come near her where she embraces them and then drags them to their deaths their watery deaths in her lake oh, i think i met her <laughs> at one point <laughs> <laughs> all right anyway so the, this piano work is um sort of um it has this very watery feel to it. Like if you ever hear the piano original piano version of it, you'll hear it at the beginning. Um, oh, by the way, I'll mention this now. If you want to hear an absolutely spectacular piano version of this work, listen to Ivo Pogorelich's recording. He he captures this in like this preternaturally hmm. kind of eerie way. All three of these movements, he's really great at it. Um, so listen to that. Uh, Deutsche Grammophon Records, Ivo Pogorelich. Anyway, here, though, um, the work starts uh, in, almost inaudibly with the watery figuration on the piano. Uh, one of the... Well, the watery figuration of the piano work. Okay, one of the marimbas... There's no piano in this particular performance. It's three marimbas. One of the marimbas picks up the main theme over this, and it's hard for me to hear this played by marimbas just because I'm so familiar with the piano version. Mm-hmm. A lot of the detail in the accompaniment is more audible here because it's usually being blurred by the piano, by the pedal on the piano, and here we're not getting that. So we're hearing a lot of the detail of the orchestration. It's pretty astonishing that all of this gentle rhythm comes through. The rhythmic pulse is strong in this performance. Um, there's, there are some excellently taken glissandos and quick passages uh, from 2 minutes and 45 seconds to 3 minutes. Once we get to the 3 minute and 15 second mark, the volume has increased, and we're now getting a less watery and more woody quality to the sound. Um, no matter, though, this is still intriguing to listen to. Um, the accompaniment um, manages to achieve a water-dripping quality from 4 minutes on, which I thought was very cool. And the moment where Ondine suddenly drags her victim to his watery death occurs at 5 minutes and 52 seconds. And it's far less dramatic and powerful here than it is on the piano. <laughs> and listen to Pogorelich's version of this. It's like, oh my, it's, it'll just leave you traumatized. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Often pl- for, for a good reason. Often played very loudly and violently. Here it's not. Okay. You, Pogorelich manages to get this very sudden attack that really kind of surprises you. Like you don't hear it coming, even if you know the work already. Um, we hear the swirling figures representing water rings you know, that are the only thing left on the surface of the uh, pond as the piece ends. Okay. The next um, movement is um, le gibet, which means, um, how do you say this? The gibbet or gibbet? How just where you're going to be hung? This is like a, the hangman's kind of noose up there. The gallows? There. Hmm. I don't the know. The gallows, maybe. Okay. Um, this piece is about the tone colors that the pianist can generate and the uh, the piece itself doesn't change much from beginning to end. You have to get the right pulse to put this across. Um, the idea is like you're walking by this um, 
this man who's been hung in the gallows and his body is still swinging there. Mm. Okay. <laughs> these, these three words yeah. are pretty, mm. are pretty eerie. They go for something, uh, you know, sort of unsettling. Um, so it's, it's a lot like Bolero this way, except that it's mm. a lot, you know, less, <laughs> um, you know, kind of, um, yeah. <laughs> entertaining. This one's in the lower register a lot. Uh, on yeah. This one here. The ostinato rhythm is very quietly and almost undefinedly played. Uh, the thematic material in the lower end isn't played much louder. It's supposed to have an eerie quality to it, but I'm not getting that here. Um, still, the sounds these instruments are making have my ear uh, attracted so much that I'm not bothered by it. I'm not really sure the marimba can do eerie. The piano can. Um, this is just kind of continues to the end. It's really not so special as an interpretation, but it's still interesting to hear. And then we get to the virtuosic um, Scarbo. Scarbo is sort of like a, he's sort of a demonic figure that just sort of appears and runs around the room and terrorizes everybody. Um, anyway, it, let's see. Um, when the explosion of technique starts at the 43 second mark, we get something less aggressive than the piano version. Yeah, pianists are really going to want to like show off mm -hmm. this technique in this piece. It's got a lot of um, repeated notes, and a lot of those repeated notes are being played with one hand on top of the other to get in, in the because you know, you're playing some of the black notes with the right hand, and then the left hand has to hit the white notes in between those black. That's, it's really crazy, and it's at high speed, too. A lot of things can go wrong. <laughs> anyway, um, but that, it's it's an amazing. If you ever if you know anybody who plays this piece, you know, watch if you can get up close to the piano and like stand next to it while they play it. Watch them play it. It's really something to see because um, that's it's 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 very fast and it looks amazing. It also sounds amazing too. Um, this interpretation is all about sound and tone color. Um, it loses the aggression that the piano can put across in this work. Um, the piece is quietly and unaggressively played, but I, even so, I'm still intrigued to hear how each section is going to sound on these instruments. Um, the trio characterizes well at this slower speed. Um, I liked the orchestration that they came up with, but musically, this didn't excite me much. It kept my interest, but I don't think that this particular work, or these three movements on the marimbas, is something I'm going to revisit often, mm. unless I just listen to the whole album straight through. So I was interested in hearing this because I was kind of intrigued that the sound mm -hmm. was going to make, but I don't know that's going to repay repeated listenings. Anyway, we get on to um, the middle movement, Allegro Scherzando, of Rachmaninoff's Cello Sonata in G Minor, <laughs> Opus 19. Yeah, this was written uh, in 1901. This was an interesting uh, yes. interpretation of this. Yeah, something familiar, <laughs> yeah. but now very, very different. Yeah, familiar, but unfamiliar, I guess you could say. Um, so we have a cello in this one. That's Astrid Cyrenosian on the cello. Um, uh, this um, The movement has a dancing quality to it, and it really picks up an energy from Scarbo, which it really shouldn't. I mean, <laughs> Scarbo mm. should have been a lot more uh, energetic. But I guess the virtuosity required really d wouldn't allow that on, on the marimba, the marimbas. Um, perhaps the uh, presence of the cello inspires the uh, marimba players to accentuate the rhythm more? I don't know. There's a more lyrical passage that inter interrupts the dancing figure, but the opening theme comes back at a minute and 13 seconds. There's a lyrical middle section when the cello takes over, playing melodically over the quietly played marimbas. After the four-minute mark, the lively opening dance material comes back with the marimbas in the foreground again. So, yeah, really, uh, it yeah, it's a pretty straightforward take, but the sound of the marimbas on it is, is a little odd. You know, I know this piece well because uh, I, I like yeah. Rachmaninoff and I love cello, so a lot of different recordings of this. But the, the timbre of the vibes completely changes the character <laughs> of this. Yeah. Um, and... What I found is um, the cello sounds great on this. It's a really sweet sound. But the, what happens is the vibes kind of envelop the cello. And uh, what I wrote is it's like a fuzzy blanket on a sofa. Uh, it sort of uh, wraps, wraps the cello up because... Uh, you know the way that it it has to be played with on a, because a marimba has almost no sustain, right? So you have all these extra hits 
that are required to keep the tones going. Uh, so it becomes more percussive and busy in nature. And then <laughs> that's the sound that it creates. I just felt like, you know, I, I saw someone like running out with a, you know, a big blanket to hug the <laughs> the cello mm. musically in this or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I find it really entertaining, you know, because it's, a, oh, it's it a different. Yeah, I mean, it's the same music, but it creates a really different image uh, when you have mallets doing it rather than the piano. And the piano isn't really that far off from mallets, really. It is a different, a totally different kind of sound yeah, quality, though. Yeah. Okay, so the sixth um, track on this album is a, a contemporary work written last year, in fact. So it's oh, wow. brand new. Daniel Arango Prada, he's a Colombian composer, born in 1987. And this oh. is called um, Prism for Three Prepared Marimbas. Get that, prepared marimbas. Now, yeah. you might know from your music history that the prepared piano was invented by American composer John Cage. And it um, in, required you to place some... Um, for example, bolts and sort of um, door stops or whatever things in the in between the piano strings, so they make this kind of muted, chimey, often almost like a cymbal arm type mm. sound. Um, and um, in this case, we have prepared marimba, which is the first time I've ever heard of this. And they've um, got like saran wrap and aluminum foil. Or <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything. <laughs> yeah, it's usually screws and bolts and that sort of thing that they use, though paper sometimes between the strings anyway this um this particular work called prism starts with it's p-r-i-s-m-e prisma maybe maybe he's using french i'm not really sure um starts with a single marimba hit and some rumbling marimba sounds faintly heard in the background this builds to a pretty compelling rhythm by a minute and 29 seconds a lot of the marimbas sound like they're natural cells, but you do get a few random rattles and taps on some of the bars. I think they're they're like using the stick hard end rather than the felt, yeah. you know, kind of tips to get that kind of clicky thing going. Right, holding it from the mallet end. At 2 minutes and 38 seconds, we start hearing the prepared bars exclusively. They make a muted metallic sound. We're into a new section in the fourth minute where we get a lot of the natural sounds of the marimbas with some of the prepared bars thrown in for contrast. Uh, there are quite a few ringing chime sounds in the fifth minute. Uh, this work also features quick rhythmic change, rhythmic section changes, sort of like we're going through a museum with different rhythmic scenes on display. <laughs> Whenever I hear works like this, I think about that scene in um, Godard's movie, uh, Band of Outsiders, uh, Band mm. de Par, where... Um, the characters um, try to set the uh, the world record for going through the Louvre Museum, and they just kind of start and just <laughs> run through the museum. It's just one camera shot that just kind of shows them going by. The, yeah, it's, it just feels mm. like that's that sort of thing. Okay, saw this one, saw this one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a good work. Though. I don't, I'm not making fun. I just uh, that's just the idea I got when I heard the the form of it. Worth hearing. Pretty interesting. Okay, so tracks seven and eight are uh, given to Manuel de Falla. Track seven is, they're both from La Vida Breve, his sort of um, singing dance piece from 1904 to 1905. So I, I want to mention all of these works come from around the early 20th century, except for mm. the uh, last one and the uh, Arango Prada work, which is brand new. Anyway, La Vida Breve, the first one is Danza Española, number one, Allegramento a Vivo, Molto Ritmico. Both of these are very famous, actually. Um, the Falla, the first um, Danza Española is just the marimbas, and they put the Spanish rhythms across exceptionally well. They seem to be really yeah. good at this, actually, because yeah. um, they do that in Rhapsody Española, the first track as well. The familiar melody of this comes through, and there's even a castanet imitation coming from the marimbas, which is pretty interesting. I wonder how that was achieved. Uh, there's a lot of quick, repeated note playing in this. Very impressive. Track eight is uh, Danza Española number two from La Vida Breve by Falla, Manuel de Falla. Allegro ritmico e con brio. Again, Spanish feel of this piece is vividly put across. There are more castanet imitations. The repeated note figuration is impressive here too, as it is in the previous piece. And we end with a song by uh, Gabriel Faure from his three songs, Opus 23. This is called 
Le Berceau, which means the cradles. Hmm. It's a pretty odd poem. I didn't actually didn't send you the text to this. I'd forgotten about it. Um, with Kyrie Christmanson as the voice, it doesn't indicate which voice she is. Um, this uh, has uh, gentle bell-like sounds from the marimbas as the soprano practically breathes the melody. It, mm. it comes across more as a folk song here. She doesn't really sing this as a, an operatic singer. No. She kind of sings it more like a folk singer. And in fact, in fact uh, the French pronunciation in this piece, uh, I'm not sure. It's not very Parisian. It's more, I, I'm guessing it's more Canadian. This this um, mm. this um, vocalist is from... Uh, uh, Canada. She's from Ottawa, actually, but she spent more. She spent time in Quebec and in France, both. Hmm. Um, let's see. Somebody, it kind of struck me as sort of like from outside France, so Canadian, I'd say. I'm guessing. The marimba accompaniment is ghostly throughout, appropriate for this song, and this is what I enjoyed most about the pieces: the marimba playing, really. And uh, the album is just so unique in yeah. its sound and approach that I have to recommend it. I feel like uh, the timbre of the instruments took a bit of drama away from Ravel's Gaspard de la Nuit, but that's a small quibble. We're really listening for the sound these instruments conjure in that and the rest of the music, and it's a gorgeously vivid recording all the way through on this Evidence Classics label. So give that a listen. Yeah, it's really you know unique to hear marimba and then if you know some of these other pieces, especially for me, the Rachmaninoff, and then hear it interpreted, you know, something different. Yeah, mm -hmm. piano and marimba, they're both percussive instruments striking something, but uh, the effect is different, especially, you know, the marimba has to make up for what it lacks in sustain uh, with some extra techniques. And they do that, but the overall effect and impression that's produced is quite different. <laughs> especially yeah. if you're used to these works you know done with other instruments and whatnot um so um but it all brings out the charm and then lets you know you know you're hearing something special and uh you know especially you know multiple marimbas you're not going to hear that very often uh so i found that you know just adding to the charm of you know the unique instrumentation and uh specialness of this uh, recording so yeah it's a lot of fun and enjoyable and uh, especially on those earlier tracks with that deep bass, <laughs> whatever. I don't know how big the bar is on that low end of the marimba, yeah, are, but boy, they do really I wonder really if they capture... constructed something yeah. especially for that sound. Like, it's pretty amazing. Know, wooden, huge wooden beams resonating there uh, really mm. uh, comes out and uh, grabs your attention. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, really nice musicianship. Yeah, just uh, unique and fun recording. Right. And... Um, a little sad to say goodbye to the classical recordings this week, but we've got some good jazz coming up. I really very much, very much enjoyed at least one of these. So yeah, well, I'm um, sure you know which one it is. Yeah. Uh, I liked all of them. Uh, I liked them all too. We, we had actually a, uh, in the not too distant past, a mallet maestros episode, uh, yeah. focusing on, uh, you know, hitting blocks of steel or wood. <laughs> Uh, there, but the yeah. vibes are always really cool, and um, I think they are. I have this feeling. I don't. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's my own bias. Uh, just focusing more on all the things that are out there. But it's the same as kind of with organ. You know, whereas before, if I found a marimba recording, I would say, oh, you know, cool. We don't hear enough marimba these days. It's kind of the same with like organ trio or something. And now they just seem to be bursting at the seams, coming out. <laughs> With all these, yeah. uh, you know, kind of recordings and more vibes in ensembles and things that I'm finding. I don't know. Maybe there's a little renaissance of vibraphone in the, in the past few Let's years. Let's hope so. I want to bring up something that Yakovo said in his, um, you know, in the interview we mm. did with him. He uh, One of the things he mentioned was that uh, you don't hear so many Hammond B3s or vibraphones because they're electric instruments and they can easily break down. Yeah. So you're kind of, so if that happens, you're kind of, and you're at the gig, you know, there's not much you can do uh, to, to revive them. You know, you have to kind of, yeah. you know, hope for the best, I guess. So you have like a spare instrument or something. Hammond seems a lot more difficult. Uh, I can see a lot of things that could go wrong with a Hammond organ. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's also in the 19th, in the 1960s, there was that instrument uh, that was really popular, the um, 
a Mellotron? Yeah, it's a Mellotron. Mellotron. Right. Um, it has like pre-recorded like string sounds yeah. when, when you press the keys, and those went out of tune like all the time. If you were like the uh, the Mellotron player in your band, you really <laughs> were yeah. on edge all the time. <laughs> Didn't know when your instrument was going to fail. Yeah, those things yeah. Are, it's a unique sound. But um, yeah, anyway, mm-hmm. we've got a lot of great vibe recordings on the podcast so far. Um, we had a Terry Gibbs, and uh, we've heard some other. Uh, interesting ones and uh, so we've got tonight vibes as you know included in ensemble in two recordings and then as the main feature uh also with marimba uh to finish things off so i put that you know the uh, mallet centric recording as you know the ending here uh but well we'll start off with um, vibes in an ensemble here and the first recording is by uh johannes wallman a recording mm-hmm. called Precarious Towers. Ominous title there. Uh, what does it <laughs> mean? Ominous? Well, I'll I'll tell you it's not so it's not so ominous because it's uh, kind of playful actually. Anyway, this is on Shifting Paradigm Records. Woman is a uh, German-born Canadian pianist and here he's got this ensemble with vibes. Uh, he was born in 1974 in Germany, uh, raised on uh, Vancouver Island in Canada, but uh, he studied jazz, piano, and composition at Berklee College of Music in Boston, and uh, then at New York University. Well, this uh, recording here kind of developed through, uh, as lots of recordings, we've come up, the uh, pandemic and corona influenced a lot of things uh, here. Mm. And uh, the precarious towers uh, refers to uh, apparently watching his uh, daughter build tall structures uh, out of Lego segments uh, that <laughs> grew until they toppled over and fell. So that those were the towers. Anyway, on this recording, we've got uh, Johannes Wallman on piano, Cheryl Cassidy on alto sax, uh, who we've heard a few times before on the podcast, episode seven, backing up the trombonist Michael Deese, episode 24, altoism which was a recording with three saxes on it. But boy, she's going to really get to shine on this recording, uh, more so than we've heard her in the past. Uh, the vibraphonist here is Mitch Shiner, John Christensen on bass, and Devin Drobka on drums. We start out with the title track, Precarious Towers. This one's got a funky rhythmic piano intro going around a chord cycle. Well, the drums and bass join in for a go around on that cycle, and then sax and vibes join on the melody together. It's got a lot of gaps of anticipation that push it forward. Uh, Shiner comes up first for a vibes solo here. He mixes some chromatic ideas uh, with an overall bluesy sense, connecting the phrases nicely. Uh, good to get some vibes right off the start. Uh, Cassidy is up next on her alto sax. She has fleet running lines and some nice bluesy licks as well. A smooth tone. Uh, Sometimes she gets a bit of edge on there, which is also appealing. Uh, Wallman is next on piano. He keeps his solo here rhythmic and bluesy. It comes back to the melody on vibes and sax with some nice uh, drum filling from Drobka as Christensen and Wallman leave a little bit of extra space in there for him to work. Uh, They go around once more. Uh, in kind of standard form as in the beginning on the melody. The next Mm. track is McCoy. And, well, jazz fans will know that's probably McCoy Tyner. And yeah, you'll get it right from the beginning. The piano intro with sort of Tyner-esque chord voicings uh, here. Uh, Drums and bass join in, pushing this 6-8 rhythm uh, of the tune. The vibes sneak in with a rapid repeated note before joining uh, the Cass- joining Cassidy on sax for the melody. There's a lot of space between the phrases of this loping tune uh, and there's a contrasting section where Shiner adds some more nice mallet fills on the vibes. They go around again for good measure. Wallman comes in first with a solo here. Uh, he keeps the kind of insistent left-hand chords that we heard in the intro pushing. Get some nice chiming notes, percussive rhythmic figures, runs, trills, and more harmonic excursions in an exciting solo that really kind of channels that McCoy-Tyner aesthetic of uh, you know jazz piano. 
Cassidy is next with a slinking solo start. She snakes through her lines with the, these nice chord changes here. Some interval leaps, cool modal ideas, uh, very nice phrasing. Uh, everything comes down a bit soft for a bass solo from Christensen. His solo is melodic and rhythmic, ending in some intense uh, double notes, a little harmony on the bass there. They go around the melody once more, ending with some riffing for soft vibes and sax. Uh, track three, December. I should mention all these tracks are um, Woman's Originals other than uh, uh, as I'll point out uh, the, the tune after this one. Uh, but yep. three is... <laughs> I recognize that one. Yeah, December. <laughs> this starts with a repeated piano cycle of chords and drum fills uh, that build anticipation. The bass joins in, and then there's a push that gets some weight uh, with more syn uh, syncopation uh, after the bass comes in. Drupka is getting it worked up on drums. Sax and vibes come in on the bluesy and chilled out melody. Dropka works up a groove. He gets in some more tight fills along the way on the drums. Cassidy comes up first uh, with a kind of fatter tone on the alto, dripping bluesy phrases. She gets in some uh, fast runs in between the bluesy ideas. Christian Ten funks up the bass line uh, here hmm. uh, a bit for Shiner's vibes solo. And Cassidy adds some backing sax lines uh, behind the vibes. Shiner shows some fast mallet work uh, before uh, tying it back into the melody, they go around a few times, building it up with more intense drums. It comes down soft for the original piano chord cycle, this time with just light cymbal work from uh, Drobka there. Track four, as I mentioned, it's kind of a jazz standard Angel Eyes uh, tune that goes back to 1946. I think uh, what was it? Matt Dennis, the composer. Piano intro... Uh, of the melody here, uh, if you know this tune, you'll recognize it right away because it uh, comes right out in the beginning. The drums have a double time feel compared to the uh, actual tempo, the melody that's coming out here. There's a section after the piano intro with a devilish bass and vibes vamp. <laughs> it's really cool <laughs> in contrast to the angel eyes. Uh, sax takes over the melody with some bluesy phrases after the vamp. Shiner takes over for the vibes on the vibes for the bridge uh, with a backing line on sax there too. It's a bit more accented on the last part of the verse and Cassidy has some more bluesy phrases before Wallman comes in for a piano solo. The groove changes up to a hard driving medium swing over heavy bass walking. Uh, Wallman minds the minor blues here. A few cool harmonic surprises included. Uh, Drobka changes up the beat uh, to a Latin cymbal idea over the bridge. Uh, it's a good driving solo. Uh, Shriner's up next. He swings and shows some nice kind of hesitation in his phrasing before getting some dazzling mallet runs. Bluesy phrases, chromatic lines, and yeah, nice solo. Uh, then it's back to the melody once more. They stick on the vamp for Cassidy to let rip on some sax jamming and then throw in a few modulations in that vamp to keep mm -hmm. it fresh and surprising. Uh, so nice arrangement of an old tune. Yeah, this kind of reminds me, it's kind of a, a, what do you call it? Usually it's a ballad. I mean, here it's pretty upbeat. I was kind of surprised by that. Mm -hmm. But the familiar melody came through. Yeah. I was like, oh, and okay, even in the beginning, with the slow melody, yeah. but the, the as I said, the rhythm is, is you know, kind of almost a double time feel uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, extra subdivisions there. So it's kind of cool. Uh, here's a good tune uh, title, Never Pet a Burning Dog. Good advice, too. <laughs> yeah. It's got a really killer drum groove here. Uh, cymbals, hits, syncopated bass lines. Yeah, really cool. Vibes add some atmosphere before joining the sax on the melody. It has uh, a kind of question-answer-like phrases over the modal moving harmonies underneath. Uh, Wallman takes a piano solo first. It's harmonically adventurous, uh, exploring lots of minor modal ideas and some funky rhythms. Then Cassidy on sax, slinky lines again, varied articulation, some fancy finger work, some nice kind of falling phrases on the sax too. The groove dissipates for some cymbal washes under the start of Shiner's solo, but then comes back heavy as he builds up intensity on the vibes. Uh, this one he really hammers out, uh, or mallets out, <laughs> I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, intense drum inspiration from Drobka too, huge fills and hits. Uh, Shiner keeps going, while Cassidy lays the melody line over the top once more to the end. 
Uh, now we've got a little sweet uh, here, uh, Corona inspired, as we have heard many works uh, in Boy, the past few if, months. If sweet wasn't bad enough, it's got to be Corona inspired. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but actually, least, this wasn't bad. At least they came up I, with I a good name, good. Pandemica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called pa the Pandemic Suite. Uh, first movement, mm -hmm. uh, quiet out there. This one uh, starts with a piano chord sequence. Uh, it starts with dissonant tension, but it progresses through the cycle to release it. Uh, drum fills pepper in uh, behind that. Uh, Wallman introduces kind of high spaced out, slightly melancholic mel melody phrases that are uh, doubled in the bass by Christensen. It's an interesting contrast with the chord sequence. Uh, Dropka gets the beat kicking up for another contrast to the droning chords. Uh, then Dropka backs off a bit as he eases to the end with only the slowing chords continuing. Uh, it's a nice arrangement, well thought out uh, here, as you would think in a kind of suite. Pandemica 2, this one's called Unreliable Narrator. A slow loping minor swing melody on vibes and sax with lots of spaces for little fills from bass, drums, and piano. Christensen has a great bass line going under Shiner's vibe solo. It's really pretty chilled out. Cassidy comes in for a soaring sax solo. Then the groove picks up and digs in with big chord accents from Wallman, who, who then gets a solo it's got a lot of interesting rhythmic things going on uh, in the relatively sparse uh, ideas that are here once more through the chilled out melody to finish it off track eight pandemica three defeat and imprison the con man strong man gee i wonder who that is i don't know <laughs> could be a lot of figures. Uh, it could be a lot of people, but I think I know who it is. <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, what's strong here is a funky syncopated piano left-hand riff that gets this going. Dropka and Christensen make another kind of cool groove out of this. Saxon vibes work the slinky melody together. It's got a lot of interesting harmonic twists in it. A woman solos first. It's an interesting one over these shifting harmonies with lots of cool modal lines, uh, rhythmic phrases, chiming notes too. Uh, Cassidy mm -hmm. makes it smooth on this one. She navigates uh, with her silky phrasing, getting more rhythmic later and reaching some soaring notes. Uh, Shiner plays a busy solo on this one with some ascending chromatic ideas and rapid rhythmic ideas. They go through the twisting melody again to finish it. Sax had a Jerry Rafferty Baker Street sound on this, yeah. I thought. It's kind of this yeah. nice, bright, familiar sound. She really shines nice. on this one, um, more yeah. more so than uh, we heard her on the previous releases. I was impressed with her yeah. playing. Even more so on this next track, uh, we're done with the Pandemica, and we go on to uh, Try to Remember. And this is a really pretty ballad featuring Cassidy. Christensen carries the uh, rhythm with his nice pulse, and uh, Dropka works delicate brushwork on this one. Uh, and Christensen gets the first solo. He's getting a nice full witty sound, uh, and he plays confidently uh, melodic ideas. Uh, Wallman, next lush chords with a delicate and nicely articulated right hand uh, phrasing in his piano solo. And then Cassidy takes a short solo before heading back uh, into the melody, uh, but it has some really nice intensity. She sort of packs in in that short space a lot of uh, feeling, uh, kind of the way like Phil Woods could do uh, into a short phrase. And she has a really lovely tone uh, uh, that shines through here. Uh, track 10, Saturday Night Meat Raffle. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good barbecue wonder, uh, theme here. Uh, I wonder what that's good. about. A light, even clicky drum groove here. Uh, unison bass and left-hand piano lines to make a cool start. Uh, Wallman fills in the gaps with uh, in these lines with accented right-hand chords. Saxon vibes join in on a melody over the bass and piano lines that make a nice count kind of counterpoint uh, to what's going on there. Uh, Wallman solos first. He packs in a lot of exciting rapid lines. Uh, then Cassidy, who sounds smooth, uh, even with some topsy-turvy licks, uh, but then she goes really melodic for a nice contrast. Shiner's vibe solo has a Jerry lot of... Jerry Rafferty again. Yeah. Rhythmic surprises, tension-building little pauses. Christensen gets a relaxed big woody solo to finish uh, off the 
solo sequence here. Uh, once more through the melody, then there's some melodic phrases that have nice gaps for Drobka to do a little bit of intense drum filling to the end. Uh, yeah, so it's an enjoyable recording. The compositions and arrangements all work together to give it a nice cohesive feel. There's good grooves on all the tunes, a variety of different rhythmic feels. The vibes really give that extra atmosphere to the arrangement, often working on the melody heads with Cassidy on sax. Uh, Cassidy herself sounds great, uh, both smooth and intense. And the solos all around are creative and inspired. Overall, it's kind of a chilled vibe because of yeah. the kind of relaxed arrangements, I thought. Um, but I like the instrumentation, different grooves, and the solos are nice on this recording. Yeah, um, the last track, it just ends suddenly in yeah. the middle of a phrase, really, too. So that's the end of the album. Yeah, I pretty much said mellow, and I really highlighted um, Cassidy's uh, sax solos. I think that really drew me yeah. in uh, the most. Yeah, I liked her. It's kind of... It, it sounded kind of it was yeah you know, there were her um she had good ideas and the um the sound was warm and I I keep mentioning Jerry Rafferty he she doesn't sound like that all the way through just sort of at right. the end but uh, it just kind of put me in a good place because I was like a kid back then when that song mm. was big you yeah, know, yeah Baker Street um yeah. Uh, yeah I like the the slower tunes most on this actually there it's mm. a fairly mellow album but try to remember I thought it was beautiful yeah and um it's yeah good. I, I thought it was a an enjoyable album i liked it let's just say yeah and cassidy shines on here we we heard her you know as part of an ensemble and then as you know one of three saxes but uh here in the spotlight uh, she really soars with that alto sound yeah. and uh yeah good uh let me hear more of her playing and see what she does next next in the uh jazz lineup here we're going to get a debut album i always like to you know feature younger artists that are kind of bursting out and uh, so here uh, a, an appropriately titled uh, bursting out recording first move hmm. uh, by a young drummer uh, named uh, Aaron Sieber and uh, so this one came out uh, middle of May on Cellar Live Records Sieber's a 29 year old drummer uh, now he's in uh, Queens <laughs> I, Queens I guess. <laughs> oh no uh, just for the English accent. Uh, wonder what yeah. wonder what Queens is like these days. I haven't been there. I have no in a idea. Long, long yeah. Time. yeah. Anyway, Queens, New York, but he's originally from uh, uh, let's see, Washington D.C. But he attended uh, SUNY Purchase. So he's a SUNY uh, graduate in that old system that I went to too. Um, but I was out on the west of the state. Uh, he studied drums uh, under Kenny Washington and John Riley. And uh, then he was just coming up. He's played with lots of uh, big names uh, in the jazz scene. Uh, and uh, so here he is with his debut recording as a leader, first move. And uh, he's got a nice ensemble here with him. So Sieber on drums. Ugona Akegwo on bass, uh, who we've heard before on the podcast uh most recently with the uh what's his name the israeli guitarist uh, oh there. yeah and um i know him as a longtime sideman of uh tom harrell really reliable uh good bass player with a good groove uh we've got uh a very <laughs> oh i'll be mentioning this a lot as we go through this uh, interesting yeah uh, i know what you're gonna piano say piano player here uh sullivan fortner uh joining in uh, he he his playing on this album is really fantastic. Yeah, but he's kind of yeah. done in by some. We'll, 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 well get to yeah, that. we'll get to that. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. alto sax Tim Green and the vibraphonist on this recording also uh, putting in an impressive performance. Warren Wolf uh, here, and uh, so this is a live recording. So uh, yeah. some of the peculiarities um, and things that we'll talk about uh, dealing with the sound. I'll yeah, from I want that. to mention before before you get into the tracks, yeah. I want to mention that this has a really cool old fashioned blue tinted cover that kind of looks yep. like one of those old jazz covers from the fifties or sixties. Yeah, it does. And I thought that was a nice touch. I really yeah, like seeing it. That. Reminds me of uh, one of those like blue note Tina Brooks minor move or something like that. One of those yeah. covers. Yeah, 
Or also, he's he seems to like Lou Donaldson a lot, and he there's mm-hmm. a I remember the Lou Donaldson album covers were like that a lot. There was one of him eating a sandwich or something. I feel yeah. what it was called. Yeah, but yeah. Not only that, but uh, what I what I like what he's done, you know, paying reverence uh, with his uh, debut here, to uh, compositions. So these are originals by other jazz musicians. You know, jazz uh, musicians make their own original tunes, you know, for their own recordings, which often, you know, just fall to the wayside and don't get uh, rediscovered again. Uh, but he's um, done his diligence here with these tunes. Uh, that's a really nice touch uh, to pick up tunes by, you know, other jazz musicians. And uh, that makes up the bulk of the material on uh, this recording. Now, starting out with... Uh, the drummer Al Foster's composition, uh, Brandon. And uh, this one, well, it starts out with uh, Sieber setting a nice Latin beat uh, intro kind of thing to get things started. There's some dreamy rhythmic piano being out with uh, Fortner and at the uh, start here. But uh, you'll notice right away <laughs> one of the things that you're going to have to get used to. Yeah. It's panned to the extreme left. Um and this is like when, if you get any of those recordings from, like, I think, when did Stereo come out? 56. You know, if you have any of those yeah. old uh, uh, early jazz recordings where all the instruments are <laughs> panned extremely. Yeah, the pianos, one, one channel only. Yeah, I hope your your left <laughs> ear headphone works. Because if you're not going to hear any of this <laughs> in the right um, here. Well, well, there's more of an issue to it because it really sounds like he was recorded in a closet too. It's yeah. kind of the, the piano sound sounds like behind everybody. Yeah. It's, it's it sounds distant. It's really disappointing because his playing is actually really oh, really it's good. Phenomenal on this record. On this record he's really yeah. he's really yeah. inventive. I really oh, liked yeah. what he was playing. But yeah. uh, and I you know you want to do a nod towards the old style, the sound of the old recordings. Yeah, yeah. I think you well, should go so far yeah. with that. Because you know? <laughs> yeah. some of them, some of these techniques weren't very good. You know, these recording techniques, I mean. After this piano intro, uh, sax and vibes come in. They handle this choppy melody together uh, in unison. Um, Siebert changes the groove to swing, and it fills the gaps with uh, tight little fills, uh, sometimes mixing in some uh, Latin ideas on the different strains of the melody. Uh, Wolf is up first on the vibes for a bouncy vibe solo. It's got some really speedy and tricky runs. Nice work here. Vibes are uh, kind of panned a bit to the left, too, while Sieber's hi-hat and cymbals are way over on the right. <laughs> so, yeah, everything is <laughs> just crazy. Really These kinds here. of things. Um, I wish there were more, uh, you know, uh, to the right because they sound a bit crowded on the piano chords. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the uh, vibes here. Uh, the, with the vibes in the piano sort of overlapping in the same sound space, um, um, when they often you know cover that same tonal register, I wish it was uh, a bit separated because Fortner's really hammering things out here. Uh, yeah. Okego keeps the groove uh, bouncing uh, along here, syncing with Sieber while on the bass. Uh, Green gets an alto solo next, which could come up in the mix. Uh, another problem I found in the, the mix, uh, the alto is sort of subdued and it doesn't get any shine on it. Um, right. You know, I, I well, I love to hear that kind of higher glow on the alto, but that doesn't come through here. It sounds a, mm-hmm. a bit too dry. Although, can't fault his playing. I mean, it, it swings really hard, mixes up his phrasing with different rhythmic figures, uh, gets some different harmonic ideas at the end over the piano chords, too. Uh, they finish up with once more around the melody. Uh, track two, another uh, cover of a jazz uh, musician's original tune, Benny Golson, Out of the Past. It's a medium, slow, kind of shuffling swing with a nice lyrical melody. Vibes and alto handle the melody in unison again. Uh, there's a break into the first solo by Fortner on piano, and he fills it with some cute and clearly articulated phrases. It's a very playful solo. Lots of left-hand ideas and monkish crashing low notes. Uh, you get a, get a lot of uh, interesting things from him on this recording. Uh, also, two-handed figures, nicely placed dissonances in there. Uh, Wolf is next on vibes, starting out with a little kind of spaced out phrasing ideas and cute ornaments. I like how he builds on his melodic ideas uh, before going into some dazzling runs 
uh, and then returns to previous ideas to revisit and uh, incorporate them again. Uh, it's a really well-constructed solo here. Uh, okay, goes next for relaxed bass solo and the piano and drums uh, bring it down for him. Uh, back through the melody with some very nice piano fills uh, at the beginning uh, from Fortner. It's a classy ending with some fun vibe chiming added there as well. Next track, uh, 11th Hour by Mulgrow Miller. Vibes and sax in unison uh, exchange these jagged two-bar melody phrases uh, with Sieber on drums. And then Wolf is off and running on an exciting vibe solo. Sieber keeps things swinging with driving cymbals and fills all over Okegwo's chugging, walking bass. There's a little unison sax and vibes snippet. And then Green is up for a solo on alto. Uh, although Fortner uh, kind of back the vibe solo with piano chords. He lets Green fly freely uh, here just over the bass. Uh, still, uh, Green outlines the chord changes uh, clearly with his hard swinging uh, phrasing. Fortner eventually comes back in with some dense and percussive chords to drive him along. There's another unison sax and vibes reunion uh, briefly before Green makes a final funny phrase. <laughs> <laughs> on the sax when he finishes it off. Uh, Fortner's is next. He takes his time to build ideas out of kind of one-handed phrases in the middle register for a while. Uh, then he gets more playful with uh, some two-handed ideas. It's quite an in inventive solo here. One more sax and vibes phrase that comes in launches Sieber into a drum solo. He shows off some pyrotechnics including rapid fire uh, bass drum pedaling. And they finish it off with a final run through the quirky melody and the crowd shouts their approval uh, in the background. Uh, mm. Four, this is a really lovely kind of uh, breaking up of the program. Uh, Mingus's Duke Ellington's Sound of Love. Two bass and piano notes get the pretty tune launched ahead. It's slow and lush with Wolf letting the vibes ring out on the melody. Uh, Fortner offers delicate support on piano and green joins in for a sweet and swelling tone on the melody. Uh, then Fortner gets a piano solo, not too far into it, and you, he gets some really nice Ellentonian sprinkles. Uh, <laughs> that kind of thing that uh, Ellington was known for. Uh, so he pays his tribute here. Uh, very nice. He has some interesting rhythmic interactions between his hands. Uh, also, two-handed figures uh, working in unison uh, with clearly articulated notes. His varied styles on this recording are really impressive to me. Sieber then has some nicely restrained light drumming in the background. Under all this, the shimmering vibes come back to bring in green on the melody while well, Fortner continues some magical piano ideas underneath. This is very nice, really captures the spirit of Ellington. It's kind of a homage to hmm. uh, everything all through uh, Mingus's uh, kind of uh, idea here. Yeah, very really classy arrangement on this one. Uh, and then after all of these kind of uh, tributes to other jazz greats, and their original composition, Sieber brings in his own composition, the title track, First Move. Uh, it's a nice driving hard bop tune. Sax and vibes work the smooth melody, which contrasts to the busy bass and uh, drum work, also bouncy piano chords underneath. There's a change up to 6-8 uh, for one of the melody sections that makes for a nice change of the feel and groove. Uh, green comes up first for uh, an alto solo. He navigates the meter, changes nicely, blows intensely, uh, though a bit low in the mix again. Uh, Wolf is next on vibes. He's got a really uh, caffeinated solo here. Lots of cool <laughs> rhythmic ideas and some chromatic running figures added in there. His solos ties back into the melody uh, with sax again. Uh, then it comes down a bit in volume as Fortner and Okikwo go around the chords a few times uh, for Sieber to get some drumming intensity going. Uh, vibes and sax come in for a final layer to build it to the end. Track six, uh, a tune by Jerry Allen, Unconditional Love. This one starts with an intro of high bass line figures uh, working together with Fortner 
uh, shaping piano chords around it. It picks up a bossa type beat with vibes and sax bringing in a wispy melody. Fortner has a nice piano chord ideas uh, filling in the gaps of the melody here. Uh, Akigwo gets a lightly throbbing bass line pushing along as Fortner takes a solo. It's kind of relaxed, but it has a good rhythmic push from the left hand of the piano. Uh, some cool two-hand uh, synced figures as well. Uh, Wolf is next on vibes. He starts out focusing on letting things ring with simple melody ideas, and then he gets a little more busy and then bluesy and funky as well. Seabur has been keeping things kind of Latin-y and light, uh, but he kicks up a bit heavier to match Wolf's new groove here. Uh, Wolf ends with a series of descending lines over some interesting piano by Fortner before he joins back on the melody with Green on alto. Then Sieber gets some new ideas uh, for clicking things as they groove, uh, going around on the ending uh, until the final lush held chords. Track 7, a tune by Mal Waldron called Fire Waltz. This one starts with some funky and bouncy piano figures uh, that start out the melody dialogue between sax and vibes uh, with stop and start uh, trio piano bass drums underneath it. Uh, it's got a fun, playful, waltzy feel. Wolf is up for a solo, starting out with some angular and big interval ideas. He's playful, gets more bluesy with more speedy lines and some cool harmonic choices of ringy tones. Uh, then Fortner surprises once again with a densely harmonic and nervously fun piano solo that becomes more rollicking. Another unique and impressive solo by him on his album. Sex and Vibes come back for the uh, melody conversation exchange they had from before, and Green uh, then takes off for some sax soloing before they all join back uh, to waltz it to the end. We're going to finish up with uh, Bebop Charlie Parker tune. I've never been able to say this one. Clacto. Clacto Vid Sechtana. Is it, is it Dutch? Or is it I'm just a made sure. up word? Never known how to say this yeah. one. Uh, anyway, mm. pure bebop here. Vibes and sax uh, introduce the bouncy melody with a drum break uh, before it starts swinging full speed ahead. Green breaks into a solo first, bopping with intensity over long lines of ideas. He just needs to be higher in the mix <laughs> uh, again here. No. Uh, a little bit uh, yeah. too recessed. Uh, Wolf is next on vibes. He really gets a good swinging flow of melodic ideas while keeping the rhythmic snap tight in his lines. And Fortner comes up following that on piano, impressing with some synced two-hand phrases, really punchy left hand to accompany his other bouncy figures. Uh, vibes piano and sax then trade off uh, eights with uh, Sieber, who gets some final drum fun, and they go around the melody once more for good measure. Ends it all with a bouncy intro and a final drum send off. So I'd say it's an impressive debut for Sieber. It's a fine mix of originals by jazz greats, uh, one of his own added in there. He mostly holds things tight from the drum chair, showing you know, both intensity and, you know, sensitivity uh, with the material when it calls for it. He gives most of the spotlight to his sidemen, just getting in a few short solo spots. Uh, Fortner grabs a lot of the attention on this recording with his varied piano style, surprising solos, and Wolf is a real mallet maestro, great technique, exciting solos. Akego's bass, well, he's always a reliable bass player with good, solid grooves, Locking in well with Sieber, I, I felt that recording doesn't do it enough to bring out the sort of um, pulse of the bass to, uh, it's sort of a little bit lost in that live mix. Uh, and Green uh, plays well on alto as well, but the recording just doesn't do justice to the alto sound. Mm -hmm. It lacks volume yeah. and edge uh, there. So the recording quality is the only letdown here, uh, with the, especially the hard panning and the sort of distant quality of the piano. Um, the, it's it's a shame, really, because the intensity and performances are all really great, uh, and you would have liked to have been there uh, in the crowd uh, for this uh, performance. But uh, it's sort of curious that, <laughs> that they would use these hard panning kind of things uh, in the modern age of recording, uh, because in some ways it harkens back to the beginning of stereo kind of things. 
Yeah, and I think uh, like jazz listeners tend to be audiophiles as well, and I don't know that they're going to like this. Yeah. I thought this record was really exciting. It had great swing grooves. Um, yep. yeah, there was there, And the piano playing really stood out. But I was disappointed that he was just kind of, you know, just playing in a closet with the door closed, you know, in, in yeah. the left channel. He had all these, it was really interesting. And you couldn't really, not only is he just panned hard left, but you couldn't really get a good sense of what his sound is. Yeah. You know, because no it just kind of sounds like, on here, yeah, you, you don't really, you know, the, the recording is, I feel like, a real letdown. I mean, I, I know what they were going for. They were going for a feel of one of these old jazz records, but I guess. they shouldn't have done that. I'm, I don't approve. I'm sorry. Um, I did like the rec- the the playing and the, the yeah. music, though. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, but so I'd recommend it for that. You know, it's it's I would give it a listen because I think he's really good. Yeah, it's uh, nice arrangements, uh, fine solos all around. I think Sieber sounds really promising. He's got that kind of tension packed intensity. He's a really good uh, driver of the ensemble here. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to what he does next. Uh, and I, I really like the reverence he pays to. The jazz masters uh, with their compositions and his own original is nice in there too. We look forward to seeing what he comes out with next. Yeah, just don't pay re- refer- just don't pay reference to jazz engineers from that. Era. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure surprised. They, I'm sure they were great for the day, but you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not now. Mean, live, they usually have. Um, no, it's, a, it's an intentional thing. I'm sure. I mean, yeah, I guess they wanted that sound, but I don't know. I don't. I I want to hear it full. All right. Well, we're gonna finish off the. Um, mallet program here life Mm. that's the title giotto music is the label and we've got the uh, (laughs) it's a a good italian name for a label yeah (laughs) we've got uh the italian mallet maestro here marco pacassoni Uh, he's a 41 year old vibraphonist and now he's active in the U.S. here after graduating uh, from the conservatory in Pesado, going on to Berkeley uh, Music College in Boston. I guess he uh, had a previous uh, recording I checked out a little bit that was really cool, too, called Hands and Mallets in 2021, together with uh, Enzo Bocciero. And uh, now we're here on this recording, 2022. And, well, it's a trio but it's uh, larger than a trio in uh, the way that it comes out. It's larger than life a trio too. Yeah, you got uh, two musicians on here. Yeah, I guess you could. Pakistani can be on here. Who who really have very individual approaches and sounds. It's really right. really great. Pakistani's here on vibes and marimba. Uh, sometimes okay. at the same time, which uh, oh. really expands that and uh, rounding out this ensemble. John Patatucci on bass, both acoustic and electric. Uh, here and uh, on drums, Antonio Sanchez. And uh, we got all original uh, material here. Uh, the main compositions, tracks one to eight, and uh, tracks nine and ten are kind of um, free improvisational uh, things uh, at the end of the program. And so the credit to all three musicians. Uh, well, this is uh, your complete uh, vibes indulgence here on this recording. <laughs> uh, so let's dig in. And yeah, uh, we're going to start out. Yes, track one, Time Vibes. Um, This one starts with uh, kind of repeated rhythmic vibe figures built around a pedal tone that comes out in inside of that. The ends of the phrases ring nicely, sort of just echoing out there. Patatucci joins in on the fretless bass, first up high, uh, then taking his figures lower. Uh, Sanchez comes in with light drumming, and it progresses to make a pulsing 6-8 groove into the melody. Pakistani then changes up the register and chord voicings as he goes through the sections of the melody, uh, keeping it interesting. There's a bass and drum interlude with some long-held bass tones from Patatucci. Over the subtle drum figures of Sanchez, uh, Pakistani comes back in with some melody riffs before launching into a solo that starts with uh, some nicely repeated notes. I like how he connects his phrases and builds on ideas. He uses a lot of rhythmic variation in here, too. Uh, he builds it up with chords back into the melody, letting the uh, end ring and pulse. Uh, he works into the intro section again, 
with some more high melodic uh, bass from Petitucci. A nice start here. Track two is the title track, uh, Life. This one starts with a hypnotic rhythmic marimba idea with a lower melody and higher accompaniment. It seems to be in like a seven beat phrase, but the downbeat is anticipated. Uh, it keeps you guessing a little bit. Uh, Sanchez adds light clicks and Petitucci, very nice fretless counter lines. It works into the main melody figure played on vibes, which is pretty and haunting and then takes on a more assured 6-8 feel. Uh, that switch between 7 and 6 happens again throughout the tune. Things quiet down for a marimba solo, and then Pakistani stretches out the rhythm feels with kind of flowing phrases here. It's hard to get a marimba to sustain, but the recording here has enough reverb to capture them uh, really nicely. Well, actually, it has some vibes going on under the marimba here at the same time for some longer sustain, so that sort of helps add another layer to the music here. Patatucci next gets a dreamy kind of bass solo. It's you know This is kind of his signature sound. It, it's really clear articulation in the upper register, pretty melodic ideas. The main melody figure returns on vibes, and then Pakistani takes a vibe solo next. It's full of pretty melodies, rhythmic figures, uh, once more through the dreamy melody figure uh, to close this one out. Track three, Marim Bass marimba and bass put together and and that's what it is it's a kind of conversation between the two instruments uh, patatucci starts it out on acoustic bass on this tune a syncopated bass figure line featured here then pakosoni joins in with steady repeated marimba chords that increase in volume while sanchez adds simple touches it builds the melody builds to the melody rather which gets a nice calypso kind of feel pushed by bass figures and then breaks into a bass solo line over rolling marimba figures for a section. Sanchez adds a little push with snare figures. Then Pakasuni takes a solo with a kind of happy marimba melodies over Patatucci's bouncing bass. The carefree looseness in his lines is relaxing. It goes into a little rhythmic vamp of marimba and bass figures with a few vibe shimmers added. And then Sanchez mixes it up on drums, uh, which are... His drums now talk about panning. They're really wide in the mix here, so <laughs> yeah, it's that, like that's typical of him. Though I've heard other recordings yeah, of him, I think that's it's like part your of head sound. is like right inside the drum set, and everything right. is going to wrap around you. Back uh, to the main marimba melody and bass exchange uh, once more. Uh, there's a final section of high marimba soloing over more shimmering vibes as Patatucci pulses it to the end. Uh, it's a very light and fun arrangement. Track four. Valse a trois, a waltz that actually starts with a four beat hmm. feel, <laughs> if you're counting, and ringing vibe phrases. It shifts to a waltz feel as the bass and drums join in and the melody starts to pick up. Patatucci gets a strain of the melody before it's back to the vibes and then a bass solo. Acoustic bass here again, and it's melodic with that clear attack. Little bends of pitch that Patatucci is so good at when he, when he can hit one of these notes and bend it. He must have really strong hands hmm. to pull off those clear attacks and, and little nuances of pitch. A ringing vibe solo is next. Uh, listen to how here Pakasoni backs himself with chords sometimes doubles the melodies uh, in a different register. Once more through the melody after the solo and a pulsing decay of the final vibe tones. Uh, really nice. Then track five, Un Lento Bolero. So a slow bolero dance. This one, really attractive. A sneaky slow drum intro surprises you at the beginning. Uh, bass and marimba join in with Patatucci sketching out a melody over the marimba in 7-4, you get 4 and then 3 on this uh, kind of bolero here. But the vibes are next with the melody. Uh, back to the bass for a section, uh, this time with vibes underneath. Patatucci gets a bass solo with some bluesy feel on a riff that he develops. And Pacosoni gets a marimba solo. Really great clear attacks, pretty melodies. Back to the original melody exchanges with bass and vibes. And it ends with a fun little rhythmic vamp between the bass and marimba that finishes the sexy dance. Track six, Italian Creativity. This is a really rhythmic marimba number 
uh, it starts off with a cool riff idea in six beats for three measures, and then there's one bar of four, and then that cycle repeats. Uh, it keeps you guessing what's going on. But as the rhythmic melody forms forward, it uh, sort of seems to stay in six beats uh, for the meter. It features cool ascending kind of runs. The marimba vamps out on chords for a bit uh, to let Sanchez mix it up on drums. Patitucci is back on electric on this tune with some sustained notes underneath everything. It resets almost midway through the tune with a kind of new rhythmic marimba pattern in four, and Patitucci adds some magical kind of dancing bass lines here. There's another pause and a slow four beat groove with a loping bass line makes the kind of basis for a marimba solo that shows off some of the lower register and rapid mallet work. Pacassoni gets into a rhythmic figure to end it with some accents from Sanchez, and then it's back to the beginning melody uh, to finish off the tune. All these tunes are his original compositions, by the way. Track seven is a really attractive one called Anita. There's a kind of ringing vibes and haunting melody here uh, with what sounds like a high bowed bass line by Patitucci. Uh, before he goes into uh, plucking on the acoustic bass. This is really pretty, slow, but it picks up momentum from Pacassoni's rhythmic playing. His vibe solo here is really beautiful, with ringing tones, offset hits with mallets. Uh, I mean, you know, you'd be doing a, a thing where there's just a slight delay between the hits of uh, two of the mallets. Interesting rhythmic figures. Patitucci makes the acoustic bass really sing on his solo on this one. Uh, they go around the melody once more uh, and then they let it ring away. Track eight is called Train Trip. Uh, this one's really interesting harmonically. It's a sexy minor groove uh, that's set with marimba and patatucci. It gets a, a kind of acoustic bass melody in there too. The vibes answer with an uplifting contrasting section. After a pause, the next strain of the melody uh, is on bass with more of a major melody and then uh, it switches over to a kind of a happy vibes kind of feel. Uh, next, Patitucci gets an improvised solo and then marimba. Pacassoni switches uh, straight to vibes on the uplifting section uh, to finish out the solo, uh, kind of seamless uh, marimba to vibes. They go through the pattern once more, muting things a bit on the mallet work for Sanchez to do some Nice subtle drum work, but with a few kind of cracks of thunder that break through in there. The changing harmonies and moods make this tune very intriguing. And we'll finish out the recording with uh, two kind of improvised pieces. So, you know, the musicians get together and just start playing and see what happens. So it's kind of a, you know, stark contrast with uh, the material that's come so far. But uh, these are kind of interesting if you're in the mood for uh, just seeing what uh, comes out of uh, sort of free dialogue between musicians. Uh, track nine is conversation number one. Uh, as I said, it's a free improvisation. It's fun to hear the grooves that develop here between Patitucci on electric bass and Sanchez. Pacassoni takes a lot of uh, idea trying out uh, here, uh, including using, uh, I think he's doing the... Uh, stick end of the mallet uh, like we heard mm. in the classical uh, flipping the switch the uh, stick over for a light marimba effect I uh, switches between marimba and vibes on this tune midway through a new funky groove emerges Pacassoni tries some really staccato uh, and short-lived note play ideas and Sanchez gets the tempo speeding up but then he pulls it way back for some bass soloing from Patitucci, and it continues to slow down like an unwinding clock spring, but not without a final groove to uh, carry it out. I want to just mention another wonderful thing about this track is hearing the uh, the engineer say, rolling uh, in an Italian yeah. accent. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, you get the feeling these two were just captured while they were in the studio. Uh, maybe they decided yeah. to jam out and uh, they thought it would be a cool way to uh, end the recording because you do hear the, some uh, vocal uh, kind of uh, right. Right. comments on both these tracks. Um, and the final track is uh, Conversation 2. This one's a little bit more adventurous of the two. 
because it starts with um, bass bowing by Patitucci that gives it a kind of more free and amorphous start with uh, kind of sparse marimba phrases peppered in. Uh, Patitucci gets a groove flowing then from one of his ideas with uh, his kind of bass figures that uh, Sanchez picks up on. Uh, Pacassoni then uses more of a kind of clicky stick thing here for hits. And then Patitucci goes back to some bowing with some uh, choppy rhythmic intervals uh, there. Uh, while Sanchez digs kind of a really groove out of some tight hi-hat. Uh, it's it's really tight work uh, done here. Uh, Pacassoni and Patitucci have some dialogue uh, going back and forth. Uh, there's a new slower groove that emerges and Pacassoni floats kind of sustained vibe chords while sprinkling marimba figures before the groove finally softly fades away. And that's it. It's a uh, engaging recording fabulous sound quality uh yeah this tops so probably too, everything rich. uh even classical and jazz of this week i thought um it could be yeah pakistani's originals here are catchy and rhythmic with fun arrangements the variety of the trio uh you know you'd think just three musicians but it gets expanded because the way pakistani plays here uh he has marimba and vibraphone on the same tune often and he whatever effect or uh, idea that he wants to achieve, uh, he just switches up, you know, between the instruments and uh, sometimes playing them at the same time. And uh, also the uh, variety is expanded by the amazing bass work of Patitucci, who has uh, equal prowess in uh, electric and acoustic bass. So his um, electric uh, work especially, not, not only can he lock in uh, grooves on the bass, but he also becomes another melodic voice. You know, really nice melodic conception. He can take over a strain of a melody and, and do it really nicely. When he solos on the acoustic bass, that clear attack and the little nuances of pitch are always really nice. And, you know, that melodic nature that he has, especially to his bass, uh, electric bass playing, is taken advantage of in the arrangements by Pacassoni. Sanchez is tight, mostly subtle on this recording, but he really adds to the interplay uh, and locks in tight with Patitucci. So, yeah, I thought this was a wonderful little uh, jazz excursion. I know you like this one a lot, and you were looking did, for yeah. it. The only thing it's I can expensive. say <laughs> on this one, <laughs> sticker shock, Amazon Japan, 4,000 yen. Yeah, Top that's going to be like uh, a little over $30 American, I'd say. A little over $30 American, <laughs> but it's on the, on the U.S. Amazon for $21. So who's gouging <laughs> here, Bezos? Yeah, well, the uh, thing is, if they ship on. it here and we get this awful like exchange rate that we have at the end now, yeah, I mean, it comes out cost... to wash, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I have to I don't know. go to America and like get it there or something. Mm. I don't know. Get it shipped to somebody free and then have them, yeah. you know, send it to me or hold it or something. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I like this album a lot, as you said. Um, I also like the Pacassoni's, like, uh, really wide vibrato. He, it was oh, much, yeah. much more than normally you would hear. Yeah, you know? and I, I love the way he lets it ring out at the ends of tunes with that vibrato just widening out. Yeah. yeah it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. All right. I mean, also, the musicians here, all of them are serving the song, too. Like, nobody really just kind of steps out and really takes over. It's just fantastic. No I really like no. that kind of musicianship. Yeah, it's all just, uh, yeah no showboating at all. Yeah. And uh, the, you know, this, everything, the hot solos are all highly melodic and seemingly thematic, I also said, too. So, they, again, mm. I said they served the song. Um, I guess I could have done without the two last tracks, but, you know, it was fun to hear, I guess. Not that there's anything bad about them, but they're just the eight tracks that were prepared before that yeah, were just so, so good, good, you know, yeah. that this this kind of didn't, you know, kind of register on the same level, sort of, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So highly recommended by me. Amazing uh, recording sound quality here, too. Um, yeah. You feel like the uh, group's right there in your living room when you put this one on. Album of the week for me. Yeah. This is a great one. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I'd like to correct a mistake I made um, earlier. I mentioned that everybody should hear the Pavel Haas Quartet's recording of Dvorak's American Quartet on the Superphone label. Mm. Uh, but that is his string quartet number 12, not 14. Number 12, I said okay. Number 14. 
it's number 12 but mm. just type in american quartet and you know that's what it is it's really great right. <laughs> it's i don't think dvorak has 14 don't even quote me on that i don't even know i'm not sure but anyway myself yeah there it is mm. all right well there's your episode 70 recordings getting you some good summer vibes yep for this fourth of july weekend in the usa yeah early in the summer uh all of mm -hmm. our american uh listeners have a good uh, independence day weekend i wish i was there yeah. for a cookout with you i think it's going to be a that bit be too nice. wet <laughs> wet here to consider well we'll have a cookout soon i think you know we got yeah. the summer cookouts going on well, and, well actually we're gonna have uh podcast uh get togethers i think this summer since yeah we're, we're gonna have some podcast get togethers yeah. over the summer i think yeah. that'll be nice Come up Meaning the, we'll uh, be recording in the same room, which we're not yeah. doing now. <laughs> the mountain lair. We're going to have mm. some of that uh, Italian sausages, uh, maybe some steaks, yeah. some other things. As soon as this uh, rainy season blows out, um, it'll be a good time to uh, do these face-to-face -face, uh, yeah. for change. Yeah. Once we get the uh, work out of the way for the yeah. uh, spring semester, Looking it'll be nice. To that. And yeah. um, got a lot of themes, other things coming up. Uh, for the future, I think uh, next week we're going to have a little, uh, well, at least I'm going to have a little kind of South American uh, adventure going on. And, I got uh, some pretty interesting things. It's more of a variety, though. Um, I, I really do want to make up for the lack of an uh, American composer on this week's um, podcast. I'll have uh, John Williams' uh, Violin Concerto Number no. 2 played by um, Anne Sophie Myers last next oh. week. So we'll talk about that. Get an American yeah. uh, record, American uh, piece on there. And I'm going to go uh, yeah. Brazilian. We're going to feature a, a, an instrument that uh, we don't hear enough of, uh, other than vibes. That's the harmonica. Oh, cool! So some jazz harmonica next week. I've got the line jazz harmonica. For... You don't hear enough of that. No, yeah. that'd be great. And, uh, done really well by some of the best uh, players uh, out there. So got mm -hmm. that to look forward to. And if you want to know what those yeah. recordings are. Uh, well, after you download this uh, podcast, I'm going to get the uh, playlist up, as I always do, later in the day on Monday. Uh, so well, just check oh, that out. Oh, by the way, one more recommendation for uh, people wanting American music. There's a fantastic solo piano classical recording of um, by Marc-Andre Amlan playing William Bolcom's um, oh, yeah. complete ragtime pieces. That's on the Hyperion label. Um, we're going to talk about that eventually on the uh, podcast, but it's a double album of a lot of short ragtime pieces, and I, <laughs> I thought that was a little too much to do in a week when I have to also work. Yeah. So I think we'll have that at the end of July, beginning of August, when I have some time to just kind of hmm. listen to it over over a few days. But I was, I've been listening to it in places, and it's just fantastic. It's great to hear these works. So that's another one for your Fourth of July weekend. William Bolcom, uh, Piano Rags, played by Mark Andre. Amlan or Hamelin, if you prefer. Uh, that's a fun one. I've heard part of that yeah. uh, so far. Yeah, well, he's, he's really good on it, too. Yeah. It's really great. He's like, yeah. I mean, you can't get any more American than ragtime. So I guess, you know, like yeah. That. Yeah. Right. So check that out. I personally think swing is more American than ragtime, although they're both very American. But also we have uh, coming up, we've got some, uh, maybe some ladies, uh, Features? Oh, I've got yeah, I've yeah. got a load. I've got so many women composers that I don't think we should even, or that I don't think we should even do like, <laughs> just all women's episodes anymore. We should just mix them in with everything mix else. In, yeah. But yeah, but I've got so many that we may as well do one because I can get three of them, you know, done right. really fast. So. so this has been episode seventy. Of music, yeah, the podcast with music for the mature mind. Uh, check it out as it comes out tomorrow. If you want to hear the uh, playlist for next week, uh, check us out on Deezer or Facebook. Uh, that'll come out later in the day. Uh, if you didn't uh, catch on in time for Greek Week, go back to episode sixty-nine to catch some uh, really interesting classical Greek compositions and some fabulous. Greek jazz, including the uh, Spiral Trio, uh, which I just keep listening to and I like a lot. Uh, it's a good our, album. Yeah. yeah, really good. In our interview with uh, Yakovos from uh, Yako Organ Trio there, uh, both came out last week. 
and we'll be back with a new episode next week, episode 71 on adult music. Thank you.